we're ever truly ready, but we push the button anyway. All right, so the button has been pressed. I believe the light has gone green here on the YouTube link. I believe um, Rondell Vo and the International Space Station is looking down upon us. Nope. Um, we, we looking good down here, Ron, yes. from up yep. in the stratosphere? We're up and making noise. Okay, I am hearing some now sound looping, echoing type stuff yeah. going on here. Yeah, mute your browser. Yeah, looks like we got the ad here. Testies, one, two. Testies, 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 one, two. All right, well, we're going to do it live, everybody. Coco Talk episode 80 is going to begin in the three Mississippi, two Mississippi. David Line. This is Coco Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. Streaming live on YouTube and Roku, available as a podcast and enjoyed the world over. And now, here's your host. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Coco Talk, episode 80. The show gets older, the content gets fresher. The excitement level increases each and every week. I don't know how we do it, but we do. It's the Energizer Bunny of live shows. It keeps going and going and going. And with us on the program today, we have back after an extended hiatus and bringing balance to the force and harmony to the retro universe with his Apple II in the background, Mr. Mark D. Overholzer is in the house. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, here we go. Thank you. Yes, you're too kind, and thank you. All right, and also with us on the program from O Canada, where weed is legal and he's happy, L. Curtis Boyle. How's it going, eh? It's going good. <laughs> <laughs> he's a happy really? guy. <laughs> Let me put my we're ears down. Legally, and, uh, too. And we're marijuana and from the land of where marijuana laws were always a mere suggestion in Southern California, Mr. Steve Bjork is with us today. Hey, how's everybody going? Yeah, just, hey, you can just took one back at the beach. <laughs> sir, I'm going to have to give you a ticket for not having enough weed on you there, sir. You are under the minimum <laughs> limit. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. And we also have with us legendary game designer. Um, legend in his own mind, a guy who's very gracious and thanks us all each and every week. Mr. Rick Adams is with us. Thank you. You're too kind. You're way too kind. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> on the bottom of the screen here and on the bottom of the world, from down under, Mr. Nicholas Marentes is with us. Hello, Nick. Good day. Good day, everyone. How are you? Not bad, not bad. Up in the International Space Station in Zone 12, Sector yep. 9, Mr. Rondelvo is with us. How's everybody? Good. We've got two-for-one traveling uh, show companions with us right now. Greg, Leedy, and Jason, the Cocoa Man Riker, both being chased by <laughs> Hot Pursuit <laughs> Law Enforcement. Grant and Greg and Greg and Grant and Jason, how the hell are you guys doing? Doing great, thanks. All right, Jay, uh, Grant, you voted, right? Did your early voting? Yes, I just completed my voting for today. All right. Let's this, was, this was for the Glenside election? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm really for that one. <laughs> uh, vote Jason, early, vote often. And uh, I'm, is Nick Marotta in the audience yet? I haven't seen Nick Marotta here. Davey Mitchell is here. Rob Inman is here in the live audience. Tom C., Mark Overholzer, Al Hartman from Joyzee. Uh, Tim Franklin, one of the first people in the live chat. William Carlin is here. Uh, we don't see Nick Marotta in the chat yet, but it wouldn't be a show without Nick Marotta. So hopefully Nick Marotta will show up here at some point in time. We're here. It's a Saturday. We're going to talk about one of our favorite things, the Tandy Color Computer, the retro hobby, our geeky obsessions with things that other people would not understand or appreciate. And on that note, does anybody have a um, project update, public service announcement, um, birth announcement, uh, bar mitzvah, anything else you want to share with the group? I have one. Go ahead, L. Curtis. 
It's an un-update, actually. Uh, originally, <laughs> originally, I was planning on having the EOU beta 2 out at the end of October. I've now finally got some free time this weekend, but I realized the date's October 27th, so I'm not going to get a heck of a lot done in four days. So uh, I, I think I will just delay it till the end of November. That'll give me time to actually make a, an update that's worthwhile having. All right. So ease of use, Nitrous 9 update. Yeah. I've got a uh, list of 15 slips. things to work on, so i got lots to do. So, Wow. Um, just out of curiosity, Ron Delvo, have you had any time to post anything to Facebook this week? I've posted <laughs> one, maybe two items <laughs> in the last five minutes. <laughs> I swear, Mark Zuckerberg should have you on his payroll. For, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, worth nothing. Uh, it wasn't much. Mark Bosley has joined us in the live chat saying, hello, Mark. Hey, Mark, I have a question for you. Hey, you got your Coco 3 yet? There you go. <laughs> and what's the answer? Thank you. Yes, you're too kind. And thank you. <laughs> there we go. It never gets old. Uh, <laughs> Jason, the Coco Man Rikert, have you been fulfilling orders of switcheroos and other products the world needs? Uh, we are fulfilling switcheroo orders. Uh, we are pe preparing for Tandy assembly coming up here uh, very soon. What a couple weeks, and uh, and uh, working on uh, working on that possible new product that uh, will debut at Tandy assembly. Ooh, new products! Teasing, 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 so, teasing. So, how is the worldwide demand for switcheroos? By the way, um, it, it's doing well. Uh, uh, we have 100% saturation in Uruguay. <laughs> <laughs> and Cloud9 say as much? You've probably got at least 30% saturation in uh, Australia as well. Any Australian switcheroos? Oh, uh, wow. Okay. I've, I've shipped one, one there and uh, uh, just recently had the first one go to the United Kingdom. Hey. Uh, yeah, so we're... we're uh, we're we're adding we're adding uh, more countries to the uh, the uh, switcheroo family. How how are Antarctica sales? <laughs> Pretty weak. Uh, very cold right now. <laughs> <laughs> sales are cooling off a bit. You're saying? Okay. Yeah. What about Russian orders? You need orders from dot ru? I I did get an email from this is not a scam. Dot ru. But, this uh, is not a scam. <laughs> I haven't had time to look into that one. It's it, uh, Looking promising. Yeah, um, one of the websites we set up a while ago was the um, the we set up a rainbow online, which I don't think it necessarily went anywhere, but it's been sitting there forever, and it's a WordPress site where you could register to post your own stories. If there's not a day that doesn't go by that I get an email that somebody from Russia has registered for the rainbow dot online. I know a lot of people read the rainbow in Russia, so it makes perfect <laughs> sense that there's daily <laughs> <laughs> registrations for that. It was, it was a valid registration, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So they're actually ultras trying to submit articles, right? Yeah, and so um, <clears throat> Mark is Mark saying, do we have a first time? Mark Bosley says, "This is my first time watching this show ever." Well, you, well, you're in and for. He has, and he has two We're sorry. <laughs> for, yeah. Let's apologize in advance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we have your uh, address so we can send you a complimentary, yeah. apologetic gift? This is yeah. what we. This show is known as the. Uh, <laughs> the train wreck has already begun. So, at, at the very least, we can send aspirin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, or ibuprofen or Tylenol, whatever you take. Hey, Mark, just remember this show is a bit of a variety show. So if there's a particular segment that goes on and on and on and on, and you get the idea, uh, there'll be something better. You know, just, just go wait. off, do something for a while, come back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like a variety show. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and then that segment that you like will only be about two minutes long. <laughs> yeah. And usually it's the ending <laughs> credits from our survey with Jim Brain. So. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Jim's favorite part of the show. Uh, Nicholas Morenti's in Australia. Have you made any progress on uh, Funstar lately? Uh, not on Fun Gunstar. Um, yeah. I've been uh, working on the uh, tile map editor. So I have, if anyone wants to see what I've done, I can show that later in um, Core Dump. Okay. Um, yes, yeah. yes, please. We're going to have a Core Dump. We're going to have a well, core dump. Unless yeah. someone's got any other questions, any technical questions, we can uh, answer uh, some technical question uh, during core dump. Steve and Rick, did you want to do your little assembly 
questioning stuff during that segment? Um, that might be a good time. Depends on how long Rick can stay with us. Okay. Right. I, I, are you pressed for time, Rick? Should we maybe talk about some of your stuff before no, no, we get no. into the show? After No. I did yard work before the show, and then after the show, I'll do more yard work. So you ah, know, okay. you're, you're, you're squeezed in the middle. So, okay. so yeah, we could do that. Okay. okay. So today is probably going to be a fairly heavy show on on software development talk, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So, but if uh, not all brains are wired the same way, so um, you know, just fair warning, we're going to be talking about assembly language programming and God knows what else along the way. Um, one of the things I do want to say, well, there's a lot of things I want to say. Thank you for. Um, I do want to thank say. Thank you. Yes, you're too kind, and thank you. But last week we had a very fun three-hour marathon playing Dungeons of Daggerath. Where we did we did Daggerath After Dark, a very special uh, edition of Coco Talk After Dark. We made it to level four on Dungeons of Daggerath. Made it past the fake wizard. We're one level away from the real wizard, and. Um, that was a lifetime achievement for me because I don't think I maybe maybe made it to level three back in the day doing it off cartridge. Um, Paul Fiscarelli is here. Hey, Paul. Um, and uh, so I had fun doing that. So I want to thank you guys for um, for being along for the ride, helping me out, and just being there for moral support and sharing the fun of the, of that game. And I was thinking maybe if we have time, we could uh, do some more tonight because maybe we can beat the dungeon tonight after uh, in an after dark session so uh you guys save let me a know. lot save means, a lot say i mean stevie's gonna get past level two <laughs> i'm on level four he's already level so. four. I, I was level there four. i witnessed it yeah he must be yeah, he was cheating. He no was fake news cheating. there <laughs> i was saved games you gotta save save and save often it's just like you you know working in a microsoft product <laughs> yeah, <how much laughs> when i beat it i had to save like crazy too i mean I, mm. I, I only know a couple of people have been able to go through it without a save to win the game that's that's darn hard yeah, and we got a comment on the video. Uh, I think it was Mr. Robot Shop or one of the retro channel or something. The guy posted a video a long time ago where he showed off Dungeons of Daggerath. And his strategy, which I've read in the past too, was to repeat levels one, two, and three several times. Where after you've made it to level three, before you go down to beating that fake wizard, go back up to level one, clear that out, go to level two, clear it out, go down to level three, clear that out, rinse, lather, repeat. And when you do that enough times, you are so strong where even the final wizard can't completely harm you. So uh, I don't know how many times. He didn't specify how many times he did it. But in his video demonstration, he's like, look, I'm going to show you guys the wizard. He got down to level five. The wizard actually attacked him, and his heart didn't even freak out. So he was that strong where he could take an attack from the wizard and um, finally kill it and reveal the wings. So I've actually seen what the end looks like. But even though I've seen it, I want to experience it, you know, so um, nothing like doing it for yourself. So so that was a lot of fun. So I want to say thank you guys for that. And obviously every week you guys who get together here on the panel and everybody who gets with us on the show to watch this show, um, you know, uh, just thanks. It makes it makes doing this fun. So this is my favorite part of the week. Uh, all right, so we're going to jump in. How about we do real quick? Let's let's acknowledge some of our community sponsors. And maybe we'll take a quick commercial break, and then we'll jump into assembly. Um, so here at Coco Talk, we like to acknowledge the people and places and things that make up our community, especially those who are making things for us in the community to enjoy. So I would be remiss without mentioning the Coco VGA project. A lot of these people will be at Tandy Assembly in a couple of weeks too. So Coco VGA project at CocoVGA.com. Very cool way to add VGA clean output with artifacting and lots of other bonus goodies to your Coco. Check them out. I wonder if we'll get visited by Richard Lorbieski today of Boyson Technology, maker of the Boomerang, hottest selling product for the color computer since the switcheroo. Two megabytes, blinky lights, MMUs, you name it, it's got it. Check that out at boysontech.com. Our favorite troll and creator of many retro things, Jim Brain and Retro Innovations at go the number four retro.com. You can get accessories for your Commodore TI and color computers. Cloud9 Technologies has been making uh, Coco stuff for 20 years or longer, so you can check out cloud the number nine tech.com. Uh, cool project sdpack.com how to make a self booting uh, ROM pack on an SD card for your Coco SDC. Our very own Jason Reichard, creator of the switcheroo, you can check that out at coco3scartcable.com or um, 
uh, CocoMan.biz. Thank you to Roger Taylor for getting us live on the air on Roku on the Coco TV channel, streaming live, multi-streaming. Um, our very own merchandise for Coco Talk and the color computer and all kinds of good stuff you can get at our retro swag shop. Mark Overholz was wearing one of the shirts. You can't see it right now. But we got Coco Talk shirts and so much more at 8bit256.com. If you're a fan of the color computer, check us out at IMA, IMA, coconut.com for all things color computer. You can reach us here on the show at cocotalk.live. Let's not forget the Coco Crew podcast each and every month, bringing us some good stuff at cococrew.org. Good friend of the show, Brian Joyce at Extractus Productions, FD501. And last but certainly not least, Ed Snyder, maker of many things color computer related at the Zipster Zone, Z-I-P-P-S-T-E-R zone.com. Check them out. All right, so we're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back, and we're going to jump into some assembly language programming with Steve Bjork. We'll be back, everybody. Greetings, YouTubers. Atari Leaf here, and you're listening to Coco Talk. What's going on, everybody? Original Gamer Stevie Stroh here, and if you're a fan of vintage computing and retro gaming, then you're going to love our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. There you will find custom designs by Instagram artist Joel M. Adams. You can get I'm a Coconut, Coco Talk, and other cool video game images on a t-shirt, coffee mug, or mouse pack. So if you love retro, then head on over to the retro swag shop at 8bit256.com today. Tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stroh sent you. At GSoft, we make games for the TRS-80 Color Computer, TRS-80 MC-10, and Dragon Computers. Our basic games cover the range of genres from arcade, to text adventures, to simulations, to 3D dungeon crawls. This is our latest puzzle game from Japan, Fruit Panic. So come on and drop by our website and download our latest games. Radio Shack has a great gift idea for the whole family. Fast action TV games, and they're on sale. Get this six game model for $29.95 or the four game model for $21.95. With rising entertainment costs, that's a real bargain. You play hockey, tennis, squash, and more. Easy to hook up and great family fun that lasts all year long. The sale price TV games. Only at Radio Shack. A Tandy Company. Easy to hook up. Just get out your screwdriver. Can you even fathom some uh, some person of today's day and age saying, "Yeah, I want to hook up my uh, hook up my game system"? Where where's my screwdriver for that easy hookup? <laughs> I think they'd be too fascinated by the graphics to notice all the hookups. <laughs> easy hookup. Uh, very few pieces of toolery required to hook this thing up here. <laughs> I want to um, play squash. Squash. That's uh, not only is it a delicious uh, vegetable, but it's also a game. So, <laughs> I have love it the here. light gun. The light gun. Yeah, I have that one. The light gun. It looks like an old revolver there that was in that commercial. There, I have one of those. Like, Colt forty-five uh, long. Is it yeah. a light gun or is it a freaking laser? No, <laughs> Nick Morota has joined us. Hey, everybody! Nick Morota's here. Everybody, say hi, to Nick Morota. Hey, Nick. Hi, Nick. Hi, hey, Nick. Nick. Hello, Nick Morota. Nick Morota is here. So, uh, for the benefit of somebody who's watching us for the very, very first time today, we for, for over 10 weeks now, Steve Bjork, and uh, if you're not familiar with Steve Bjork, he's that guy who made Audio Spectrum Analyzer, right? So, uh, <laughs> so Steve Bjork has been taking us through how to talk to the 6809, assemble, uh, 6809 processor, teaching us the registers and some of the language and commands and building a nice, wonderful foundation for us to understand that CPU. Today, we're going to take it beyond the theory and we're going to jump into practical application. We're going to be looking at, um, you know, source code and assembling things and looking at things. And John Lowry is here. Yo, yo, Stevie Stro. Yo, yo, yo. What's going on with you there, John Lowry? Um, so are we ready to jump in, Mr. Bjork, and, and start talking about uh, segment 11, 11, session 11 here in our ongoing series? I think we're about pretty much ready to go here. Um, just a word of warning, I'm actually going to have in the slides the entire assembly language for this simple demo of a bouncing ball on the screen. And actually, before we actually start that, is there a way you can bring that up for people to see, Stevie? 
Uh, the, do you want to see it in the slider? Or you want to see it in Notepad Plus Plus? I've got it open up in both, actually. Oh no, no! I actually want to see the executable. Oh, the executable itself. What it's going to do, so they get an idea. Yes. Bear with me one second here, and let me okay. just um, let me just hit uh, up arrow and repeat my last command. Um, so, assem space dot move vcc. All right. Let's get it up on the screen. Let's get VCC going. Let me, um, of course, I'm not sure if I go to full left screen here. And by the way, the, the fact that I was able to do this this quickly is thank you to Paul Fiscarelli setting up yes. his Long Branch Never environment for us where we can now run uh, editor. So uh, it's bouncing. I don't know how well you can see it because VCC is running small. What is a way to get VCC to run full screen? Uh, I don't even know. Isn't there a way to make VCC bigger? Isn't there yes. like a 2x, 2x uh, zoom or something? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you have to I'm go to um, config. config. Yeah, display. And then display and then frame should, skip, yeah. composite, scan lines, F8 throttle, allow resize. There we go. That's it. We're going to hit allow resize. So now if I maximize, okay, so the aspect ratio is distorted. However, we can see now by me maximizing this, that what we have on the screen here is a bouncing ball or dot or pair of pixels, whatever you want to call it here. See, folks, this is my version of Hello World. <laughs> it's got to be graphic related. You know, it's it's this is a very simple, basic program. It's only about 160 bytes in size. And uh, that includes the initialization that you need to do for the Coco to display a P mode for screen. Clear okay. it, and then actually move the dot around on the screen. And set the color. Mm -hmm. There we so, go. All right. Well, why don't we uh, uh, stop that, and we... Okay, you got the slide there. little off the screen, though. Uh, actually, I think I'm all the way at the bottom of the slide. That's why. Okay. okay. Oh, so, all right. Just It's my monitor. Sorry. Okay. Let me get to the top of the slide, and uh, yes. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to bring up my copy uh, myself here so I can follow along too. make sure I get everything right here. But basically, uh, what we're going to do is basically go through this program, which has some information that you need to set up so that the program knows about the color computer. See, that's one thing about basic when you program it, it knows about the machine it runs on. So it does you know, a lot of the setups, uh, it understands what P mode four is and how to set the screen. Well, in assembly, it don't know any of that stuff. So we have to do some definitions at the beginning of the program to tell it about the Coco. Then we've got to tell it more about the way the program is. And another thing I wanted to bring up too, is that we don't have things like uh, variable A or, or B or C that we can store information. You have to create your own variables in assembly language. And part of the initial part of the program goes through and sets that up. So one thing too that I did is in this demo for this program, uh, it's all fully commented, not guaranteeing the spelling of everything, but it's all fully <laughs> commented. But why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide? And we're gonna spend a little time on this one so people have a chance to figure out where they can download today's lesson. There's two files that's in lesson11.zip. One is the entire source code for the program. And another one is the uh, diskette image for VCC. Okay, uh, and I will say this audibly right now for the benefit of somebody listening to this later on a podcast. We'll also put this in the description later on, but it's uh, haunthackers.com slash data slash lesson 11 zip all lowercase now I, URL. Have, I have a uh, website that we're going to use later for all these lessons this lesson will also go through it'll be coco4.com that will happen sometime next week right now i've got to move it to another server that's got proper security certificates and like that because good old mozilla firefox likes to complain if you don't have everything properly uh, set up with the security certificates. So anyways, but haunthackers.com, it does work. You can download it from that location. And um, 
Uh, we'll also be making this slide available later. Uh, right now, Stevie and I are working on taking the first 10 lessons and making videos and the slides available for you. And this won't be the second half of stuff. Anyways, um, let's go to the next slide. All right, we're gonna be using the P-Mode screen, P-Mode 4 screen, which is basically 256 dots across by 192 scan lines. Um, and I kind of say 256 dots across with a certain caviar. If you put just a single dot on this screen and you're using a uh, NTSC system like they have here in the US, that dot may be red or blue, not white. So one of the things I'll be doing is actually making the, the dot that moves around the screen two dots wide, because then it'll actually come out as white. And that's because of the artifact in the mode like that. So that's part initially, we're gonna have a, a dot, which is actually physically two dots wide for our ball moving around on the screen. Let's go to the next slide. Since, um, let's see, since we're doing it as two dots wide, there's technically only 128 positions going across the screen. And that's to keep it white no matter what position you put it in. Exactly. So, uh, and the way this particular mode works is that every single byte of screen memory contains four dots. And what they do is they use two bits together. Whether this would happen to be a PMO uh, screen, which is uh, PMO3, that's the one that has that beautiful green, yellow, uh, I don't even use that mode anymore, so I can't remember <laughs> all Blue and red. Blue and yeah. red, yeah. And then, or the alternate color, color separate is even worse, which is the, uh, what do they call it, buff, cyan, magenta, and orange. Yeah, it's just, yeah. That's the reason why when I was doing this stuff all the time, I was uh, using this emo 4 screen just to make sure that uh, things didn't, um, well, they, well, let's put it black, white, red, blue is much more colors, better colors for especially space games. So, but anyways, on this particular mode, we're trying to make sure that um, when it comes to putting the dot on there, we want two dots next to each other so it doesn't shift in color as it goes across the screen. And this little pattern that you see here on the third line is the binary pattern showing the bits of the byte. And you can see the first, you have one one followed by six zeros. That would be the dot on the most left-hand side of that byte. In other words, if it was the first byte on the screen and you want it to be the first dot, you would use that first pattern. Then if you move it over one, you would use the second pattern where it's a couple of zeros, a couple of ones, followed by four zeros. That physically moves the dot over one more. Same thing for the last two. It's moving the dot more and more. Once you get um, past that fourth location, that byte, then it goes to the next byte and starts over again at the beginning. So that's how the graphics memory works is the Highest bits are the most left side of the dot, dots in that byte, and et cetera. Now, if you were doing it strictly as one dot uh, per dot, I mean, one bit per dot, you would have just using one of, it would be like one followed by seven zeros and like that. Now, if you're doing 16 color mode, like on the Coco 3, you would use the top half or four bits to represent one dot and the next four bits would represent the other dot. So you only have two dots per byte. Yeah, uh, and if I could just if I could just take a moment here to say yeah. this this might um, help if anybody was trying to still trying to chew on binary and not quite getting where the bits fall into it. And I think Curtis you had mentioned this in the past in, in the past too, but moving a bit around seems to make a lot of sense on the P mode four screen because it's one bit per pixel. Right. So in this case here, we're looking at one byte, which is eight bits. 
And mm-hmm. everywhere you see a one, this is a pixel that is turned on. Remember, binary yeah. is on or off. So we see two solid pixels followed by six empty dots, and then it shifts over two pixels. So now we can see that we've got uh, two pixels. We got we got two leading zeros. We got two pixels. So the ball just moved two pixels to the right. Now it's moved four pixels to the right. Now it's moved six pixels to the right. So you can, uh, in in a way here, even though we're still looking at zeros and ones on a slide, you can kind of see where. It's a little bit more visual now. There's two pixels kind of panning through these eight. So if you yeah, were you can actually if, poke these on the screen to take a look at if you want to see it even from basic. Just right, kind of, right. So, you got to get a visual cue as to what you're, what you're doing. Yeah. So exactly. um, um, and so hopefully this will make even more sense when we start looking at the demo. Again, I love this here too. John Lowry says there are two types of people in the world: those who understand binary and those who don't. Of course, that's written in binary, right? So right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I love. I love that joke. The main thing I'm trying to say here is this generally how graphics work on the Coco is the bits are stored in the bytes and it pulls that information out and then plays it out as the dots on the screen. And this is actually called bit plane mode, if I remember correctly, correct? Yeah, exactly. Bit bit plane or bit uh, mode graphics. Now, uh, as we said, we've got 128 positions going across the screen. We divide that by four since we have four dots per byte, it means that it takes 32 bytes to do one scan line worth of information. And then if you have 192 scan lines, that makes a total of 6,144 bytes to represent the screen. That's getting to be a bit of information to push around. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, yeah, as Steve's already done, we'll let, we're moved on to the next slide. And we're actually talking about the source code. This is part of the source code that I'm giving you, and it's done up in segments. The first segment here is defining information about the color computer. So the program knows what's going on. Now, you could actually just put this information directly in as the numbers in your program. I like to put it at the beginning of the program so that it makes it easier to understand what's going on and change. And some of this information we're gonna be talking about is when you wanna set up a graphics mode, you have to set things up in the SAM chip. That's the sync address address, um, multiplexer multiplexer chip. And this is the thing that handles how, where video RAM is, what video mode you're in, uh, does refresh, does a lot of things on the computer. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we can use less expensive dynamic memory on the Coco instead of static back in the day. But anyways, uh, you need to be able to tell the system how to set up for this P mode four that we're going to do. And this information that you see there here without going into a lot of detail, you can, everybody's going to be able to look at it later and figure out it has the information for setting up the SAM. All those labels, which are the thing that you see on the far left-hand side, mm-hmm. that's a label or symbol for information that you're going to use later. And Would I like, that be similar to a variable in a sense? Uh, this is more Not of quite. a... It's, it's more of a constant, but it can be considered a variable. But we'll, we'll, we'll use variable for that term for right now. Okay. Uh, you will notice something that I've used upper and lower case. Believe it or not, the assembler is sensitive to that. So if you type in a label or symbol that the case doesn't match, it's like a totally different one. If I had used lowercase for Sam, and then somewhere else I used uppercase for Sam on these guys, they would be seen as totally separate variables. In other words, an uppercase S is not the same as a lowercase S. They see it as different letters. So that's something you have to watch out for is uh, if you use uppercase, watch out for it. You yeah, they're definitely case sensitive. Yeah, definitely case. Now, uh, one of the things I did here to make life easier for myself is stuff that talks to the SAM. I capitalized the three letters of SAM because I wanted that to stand out. The other uh, letters that you see there, uh, VREG, for example, is talking about SAM's video mode registers. And I try to make the symbol somewhat Self-explanatory. Self-explanatory, exactly. Being that SAM is an acronym, it would make sense to have it as capitals. Yep. And the last two lines down at the bottom have to do with setting up 
the video display port which is FF22 on the Coco. This is one the PIA is on there and puts out information to the video display generator. That also needs to be set up. So that's what those last two lines are doing. They're what port you're going to have to put information out to. And guess what? The next line is the information you're going to put on that stupid port. <laughs> so... And I will mention here too, I mean, you can write a semi-language where you're you're changing the values in these memory locations directly, like directly doing a story at FFC0 or whatever to set up your SAM, your VDG, et cetera. But if you try to look at the code, you know, six months later, or if somebody else is trying to look at the code, they have to try to like look up in a table or chart somewhere, you know, what, what does that memory address do? I can't remember type thing. So having your label set up like this, so it's much more self-explanatory, it really helps you debug your code. By the way, the comments that you see on the left-hand side, do not affect your program. Be verbose. Label more than you think, because at some point you're going to come back and look at your code and it's going to say, what the F? <laughs> you need these comments to explain to you. So while you're writing the program, if you need to put down two or three lines to explain what that one line of code is doing, do it. Yes. It just makes life easier for you later. I can totally vouch for that after going through nitrous nine code I wrote 20, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's go ahead and pop to the next uh, slide. All right, this is more definitions. We're gonna define information about the screen, the graphics screen that we're gonna be doing stuff to. Uh, the max dots of X and Y, that's the size of the screen. Uh, we've got the number of bytes per line. Yes, I could put the number 32 in the program, but this just makes it much easier. Also, there's different modes on the COCO that have different number of bytes per scan line, especially in the COCO 3. And there's a typo there. Uh, I didn't get the Y when I typed in bytes. Oh, well, in the, do in the documentation. Ah, yeah, in the comment. I see that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And then it's got a location for where screen memory is at, the size of the screen. And this last one's going to be used much later in the program. This has helped me to understand how many CPU clock cycles there are in a 60th of a second. Just something I'm going to use later in the program. Easier to put it up at the beginning to define it. See, if I was running at double speed, I wouldn't want to, I would want to change that number. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. See, it makes it easier to modify your code because you change it in one spot and it affects the rest of the program. Yeah, every reference to that label later on will use whatever changed value you do up at the top here. So you don't have to remember to change 15 different lines later on in a large program that all have that same value being used. And by the way, if you were um, working on, say, a PAL system, you would probably want to change that too. So because they, they clock at a different frequency. Yeah, 50 hertz. Yep. Anyways, um, Remember before I said there's no such thing as like variables like the letter A and letter B and you have to kind of define your own variables. Well, that's what we're going to do here is we're going to define some variables for us to store information in. And this goes in the direct page or page zero. So I simply do a org zero to tell the assembler, hey, the stuff that I'm matching here, it starts at the beginning of memory. And the first thing is this screen. This is a variable for me to let me to let me know where a particular where my screen is that I'm currently working on, and this will become uh, a very important variable later when we do um, screen flipping. This is a 16 bot address. This is a 16 bot. The RMB means. I'm just messing. I'm messing with your typo here. That's all. Uh, okay. 16 <laughs> oh, bot address. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, you Are, can put whatever you want in the comments. <laughs> you did. Hey, you did mention that. Don't blame me for spelling at the beginning of the yeah. segment. <laughs> I, was, I was typing this stuff in pretty fast. And one thing about editors, they do not have a spell check. Yes, that's true. It's on Notepad++, right? So. Yeah. So. If I ever write an editor, I'm putting a spell check in it. <laughs> <laughs> put at least 16 bots in that, too, while you're at yeah. it. So. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so this is a 16-bit address that contains the where our screen is in memory that we're working on. Because if we're doing page flipping, you would actually have two different screens, and you got to be able to tell the program what screen you're working on. So I'm setting that up. Uh, dot memory, 
this is where we drew the ball last time. Uh, and then what was there, we're going to use that to store the graphics data that was at a location. Because when we draw our ball on the screen, I want to be able to erase it. So what I want to remember is where that ball was in that screen memory and what was there. So before I draw the dot there, I use this information to erase the last time, remove what was on the screen the last time. So it erases the old ball and draws the new one on its, in its location. And go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, uh, have we explained what RMB means yet? I don't think I did. Um, I was hoping people have read the documentation for the assembler, but no, RMB means reserve memory byte. And yeah, so an RMB2 means it's reserving two bytes, and where that is getting addressed is based on the org statement, the origin statement. So we've mm -hmm. said you know, we're starting in memory address zero with the org statement. This mm -hmm. screen will now reserve two bytes at location zero. Dot memory will reserve the next two bytes, so that'll be location two, et cetera. Exactly. And these are in the direct page, which I said in our previous lessons when we talked about memory addressing, direct page is a shorthand for addressing information and memory. So it allows you to do it much faster and without the instruction, it actually reduces the size of the instruction. So these are variables that will get used. They're important. So I put them in direct page. All right, let's go to the next slide. I'm not going to try and spend too much on these things, but here we go. Uh, the following is information about the X and Y position of our dot that's moving on the screen, along with its delta, or another way to look at it, is X and Y speed. Now, these are being reserved as 16-bit values, in other words, two bytes. And the reason why I'm breaking this up is the most significant bit, a byte, which is the first byte, is the whole number or integer number of its position or speed. The second byte is how I'm doing fractional or something like, think of it as like there's a decimal point between the first number and second number. The second number is being used for like 0 0.01 or something like that. It's basically giving a fractional speed. Uh, so we can actually have things move, you know, at different speeds, different angles. If, if it was moving strictly one by one, it would be a very boring bounce around the edges of the screen. Yeah, just a straight 45 degree angle bounce. Yeah, and this yeah, way you can vary it to whatever angle you want. And, and we'll be seeing that when we actually do the initialization, how we play around with it. But it's a very simple and, way to do real numbers or whole, you know, real numbers instead of just doing some, but you're doing the math as integer math which is what the microprocessor does very fast. So when we actually get in there and do this stuff, we'll see that um, how this is used that way. But once again, we're setting up, this is like my variable X, variable Y, and variable X, S for speed of X, and X, excuse me, Y, S for the variable speed for Y. It's just a very fast way of doing it. Next slide. In programs, and by the way, the org 3F00, that is setting up in the la at the end of the first 16K of RAM. And this particular program is less than 256 bytes, so starting where I did, it will fit in there just fine. And yes, I do think in hex. <laughs> and I can cast spells too. So anyway... Uh, um, this helps, helps us set up some information that we're going to use to draw the uh, particular graphics dot on the screen. And as I said before in our documentation, uh, two bits together represent uh, the actual dot on the screen. And you have to do two things when you're going to put something up on the screen and you don't want to destroy the graphics that are around it, you have to mask. Because if you were just to write in uh, something where it's one one followed by six zeros onto the screen, it would put the white dot up there, but it would then set the other uh, three dots after it as black. And if you had graphics up on the screen, you would now start getting a white dot with three black dots behind it. You don't want that. You just want to draw the white dot. 
And this table here does our masking for us. This is what we talk, when we're doing graphics, this is what we talk about masking. This is what's going on. So the first byte allows us to figure out which bits we're gonna change and which ones we want left alone. And believe it or not, it's the zero bits that we want to change and the one in our first example and the one bits we don't. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna add this to the screen. So we're gonna take what's on the screen and this and it's gonna take the dots we wanna change and make them zero. Well, that just takes the dots we wanna change and make them black. Well, the next byte we or to that information and it makes those dots white again. It looks like a long ways to go around it, but what it does is it forces us only to change the first two bits and leave the other bits alone. Leaving your background graphics. Exactly. Untouched. The first byte is the mask. The second byte is the actual color that we're putting in there. Now, so, Stevie, but, you, you actually demonstrated this in, in one of your basic lessons when you're doing a little spaceship with a see-through window, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. <clears throat> is is there a way that you can think of explaining this if you're for anybody that's new to masking? That might be easy to easy it, to understand. Well, it's, so we're talking about doing like the the paper cutout of the screen behind yeah. it before we put it on there. Exactly. And, and so we're basically cutting out. In, in in this case here, on on the first line, these two zeros is what we're cutting out. So we're basically saying in this one byte or this one group of eight pixels on the screen, we're going to cut out a, a hole of just two pixels but we're gonna leave the rest of that alone. And then the second pass, we're gonna fill in that hole with whatever part of our image that we wanna put on there. Yeah. Um, and so, because it, it, we're dealing with black and white, it's almost irrelevant, but when we're dealing with colors and backgrounds, you have to respect what's there. You have to respect what other bits were already on the screen. So you go on, when, with a mask, think about, you're gonna put a masking tape over before you spray paint, right? So everywhere the, everywhere the tape is, is not gonna get covered. So we're just taping off the screen that we don't wanna get painted, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, everybody on the panel got that? I just figured since Stevie's more of a, be a beginner on this, uh, on yeah. assembly language, he would probably be able to explain it better than either one of us could. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let's go to the next slide. Very, all right. We're going to actually do a subroutine next. This is a routine that I'm going to actually use twice in the program. So uh, subroutines allow us to write the program once and use it many times. Uh, this little bit of code. And this one here has to do with setting up the SAM chip. Now, most of the time when you talk and you're setting up information for things that are connected to the computer, you have an address you talk to and you send it data, you know, like store number to it, not the SAM. The SAM is a very weird thing. It's, you have to sit there and look at even and odd addresses. If it's even, you're, you're clearing the bit. If it's odd, you're setting it. It's just a funky way to do it, but hey. Yeah, basically they mapped it so that every bit on the SAM requires you to write or read an entire byte. Yeah, uh, look, it's, it's the fact that you're writing even or odd sets or reset the bits. And that's basically, if you, if you just get from there that you have to write to memory locations that are even or odd to set the information, that's all you need to know. And uh, what I like to do when I do my routine is I like to explain with comments before it what registers you used, how they're used, what information's going in, what registers will get changed, and if those registers that are passing information in are changed, I like to know about. So basically, I'm using the registers that are built in the CPU, the A, B, and X registers, to pass information to this routine so it knows what to do. Pretty much straightforward, Steve? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yep. It's the same in basic if you reserve some variables for a, 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 you know, a go sub, you know, and your yeah. go sub is going to modify A, B, S, B, and you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Okay, the next slide. Uh, it goes through, and this is the actual routine. Now, as you recall, the letter A had the data, and oh, well, we've got to figure out what is the first bit, you know, which is the lowest bit, the bit to the farthest right. So we do a logically shift to the right A, which takes that bit, the lowest bit, bit zero, and puts it into the carry flag. And then we can respond to what the carry flag is. And I tell it to uh, branch if the carry flag is set to somewhere later in the code. 
And the next thing simply does a store A. It doesn't matter what we're storing there. But by storing A at X, since this point here, the bit was zero, we're storing it at the even address and then we're telling X to move forward twice. So this is actually setting zero to the SAM chip. Uh, as I said, it's convoluted to do it, but that's what it's doing. Uh, if you notice, there's a branch, excuse me, set SAM data one. Uh, that's where we branched if the, if the bit was set. And that one there moves X forward off the even address to the odd address then it stores A at the odd address and move X by one. And then it's very simply after that, it decrements B, which had the number of bits we have to update at this time, and then branch back up to the top of all this gobbledygook to uh, continue doing bits if we haven't gone through them. That decrement B basically will take B and extract one from it, and the zero flag gets set or reset based on the status of B. Once B reaches zero, it will be equal to zero and won't loop anymore. So that's all this routine does is goes through, counts the number of bits I wanted to set, goes through and figures out what those bits are and sets SAM accordingly. But you can see why I didn't want to put this twice in my code. I just only wanted to do it once. So I'd made it as a subroutine and sure. we'll see shortly how we did that later. Let's go to the next slide. If people need to spend more time looking at this stuff, the source code's available, take a look at it. Yeah, and also feel free to pop in on Discord and ask any of us questions on it. We can help you out if you have any questions. And definitely. All right, let's actually get into the start of the program. And I use the word start to as a label to say, this is my starting point. It just other people use entry, uh, other people use other names. It doesn't matter. I like using start. Yeah, I know some people like to use the name of the program itself as the entry point too. So if, if your Ugh. program is called Ugh. dot, you could call Ugh. it dot. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. It's Let's just, get into tabs versus spaces. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, hey. I do it like Steve does too, but I have seen some other source code where they just, the entry point is the name of the program itself. In in C, everything is, starts with main. Same thing with... Uh, you know, main? Main, M-A-I-N. Yeah. You know the main is where it starts. Mm -hmm. There's a now, reason for that. Yep. Now, when it comes to um, your variables and like that, in basic, when you define a variable, it defines zero. This is not the case with uh, assembly language. The variables you're going to have to clear. And we're going to go through and start doing some initialization. The first thing we're going to do is clear the screen. We want to, you know, this is like a, a P clear command. So what I do is I load up X with the uh, screen memory uh, location plus the screen size. And what this does is actually points X to just the, the one byte beyond all that. And so one byte past the end of the screen. Yeah, right. one byte past the end of the screen. The reason why is I'm gonna be using the um, decrement X option mm -hmm. when I'm moving along. But as you notice, the minus sign is before the X. That means it gets minus first before X get used. So when I do the clear X comma minus X, mm -hmm. or you know, the clear comma X minus, it will decrement first and then clear the byte. So we have so, to start off one one to the right because we're gonna be subtracting before we begin. Before we, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And then to figure out, have I've gotten to the beginning of memory and all clearing this stuff? It does a uh, compare X with screen memory. And that's the beginning of screen memory. So if we if we still have not reached that location, it will loop back and clear. So this is a very tight loop that does nothing more than clear out the screen, which is 1,000, excuse me, 6,144 bytes. As you can see here, I'm using these labels that I set up earlier mm -hmm. for screen size and memory, you know, screen memory and stuff like that. That way, if, I go to a larger screen, 
I only have to change them in one place at the beginning of the program. I don't have to change them within the program. Right. Yeah. And also for the pointer for the screen, like he was mentioning, if you're doing page flipping, say so you have two screens, say one's at 2000, one's at 3000 hex or something like that. Mm -hmm. You could actually just change screen memory to 2000 or 3000. Exactly. Top part of the code and it would instantly change the rest of your program to follow. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. But that one just puts zeros into the screen. It clears it. Next slide. Ah, you're there already. Good. Um, now, since the extra is pointing to the beginning of the screen when it finished clearing the memory, I went ahead and just stored X into this screen. It saves the start of screen there, so it knows about that. Now, there's a couple of variables I was using called uh, dot memory and what was there. This is to help me clear the screen later but I should probably initialize it with the information that's on the screen so that when I clear the screen, it isn't garbage. As I said, assembly doesn't set these things up for you. So I stored X into our location of our dot memory. This is where the dot uh, was on the screen before. And then I pulled the information off the screen with the uh, load A comma X and then stored it at what was there. So I can erase it later something that will be self-evident when we get out into the main program. One, one thing I should mention that maybe, you know, basic programmers may not be familiar with is that like basic tends to initialize variables for you when you first use them. Yeah. I, uh, assembly yeah. language does not do that. Assembly yeah. language could have you know, random stuff from a previously running program. It could have random stuff from when you first turn it on. So you have to basically assume that you have to initialize everything yourself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, next screen real fast. Uh, this one here goes through and sets up the video display generator for the proper graphics mode. Uh, it loads up A with that reference I made earlier about uh, what is the information for a P mode for a video display generator and then stores it at the VDG port, which is um, FF22. So once again, this helps with these labels that make you know, makes sense. They're almost self-documenting of what's going on. Instead so, of you memorizing every single IO address that the Coco has. It gets confusing. Anyways, uh, next slide. Okay. Now we're going to try and keep moving quickly here. All right. Um, this first one is setting up information and call that SAM setup routine that I had earlier where it loads up the information about the SAMS P mode information loads up how many bits are related to it. That's if you see the SAM uh, V registers, uh, BC, BC stands for bit count. It's just a notation for me. Okay. And uh, SAM uh, V registers is the memory location for where the addresses are for V1, V2, and V3, then you simply call the routine and it goes through and sets it, sets it up. Now you can also see by me having this routine that sets up the SAM somewhere else, when you look at this part of the code, it says, oh, okay, this is information for setting up the SAM and then we're moving in set SAM data. Okay, we're setting up the SAM. It helps makes the program more understandable when you, from when you look at it later. Self-explanatory. You got it. Yeah, I guess I guess what I'm not following here real quick, if I can just ask a quick dumb question. I understand load A and load B, that's the A and B registers, but isn't X the combination of A and B? No, nope, that's D. D. D is. Oh, that's D. D. Okay, that's where I got confused. Yeah. Okay, never okay. mind. Yeah, very good. It's good to ask those. All right, and then we also have to tell the video display gener generator where in RAM should it find the video screen. And that's what this next segment does. So the load A is I'm taking the screen memory and dividing it by 512 because the way the SAM works is it can only have the video display generator or the video display memory starting every 512 bytes. So it could be at location 0, 512, 1024. You get the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, let's go to the next one. Um, this is more like how you have to set things up in basic. You've got to program your variables. Otherwise, they're just garbage if you don't. 
And this is basically setting up for the X and Y position. Now, remember before I said that the um, position is actually a 16-bit number where the first byte is the whole number of the position and the second byte is like a fractional. Well, what I'm doing here is you've got 32 is the position I want. I multiply it by 256, so that will go in the top byte, and then I add 128 to it, which is 128 divided by 256, or 0.5. So I'm basically putting 32.5 into the X position. The Y position is getting 64.5. So that's what's going on there. That's why I'm multiplying by 256 is to get that first oh so you, you get a rollover so it goes to a new byte and using that yeah. byte for your okay yeah gotcha. if you remember a byte has values 255 of, uh, is the yeah. highest so it's 256 forces it to go over to the next byte yeah. exactly okay next yes. slide uh the next slide we're talking about setting up the deltas or the speed that the ball is going to move and the first one low d with 100 hex and i'm i'm purposely throwing different ways of numbers at you uh hex makes it easy to see that one is going into the high byte and zero zero is going into the low byte and that means it's going to move one dot per game cycle or frame cycle and just for reference if he was doing it the same way he did on the previous slide he would have done low d one times 256 plus zero in this case right and then we store D at delta. We load up Y with a whole number one. And then we're moving at 0.25. That's what the 40 is. It's 0.25. So we're actually moving a little little faster on the Y. And the reason why we're moving faster on the Y, uh, you're also looking at more scan lines. You're looking at 192 up and down, where it's only 128 across. So I just decided to do that. It just makes for a more interesting display. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. See you staying on top of this. I love it. Anyways, <laughs> we're actually now at the main loop, the beginning of the per the loop that we're going to go through and do everything. This is the key. And the first thing we're going to see here is we're going to update the X position by t loading D with X position, adding the X delta to it. And then we got to see, did we go off the screen? And that's the number of dots across. Now, remember, uh, the high byte has of the 16-bit value has the whole number in there. So I'm taking the number of dots across, multiplying it by 256. So we're comparing against the, the high byte only, essentially. And did we move off the screen? Branch of lower means that we're still on the screen. So we're skipping to X in range. It means we're good. Let's go to the next slide. Well, since we uh, are basically going to go off the screen, well, we need to uh, basically reverse our direction. The way we do that is we basically do a negative to whatever our speed is. Easiest way to do that is get a zero into the D register by clearing A and B and then subtracting our delta our x speed from it and then so we zero minus that. the current speed which makes it negative right exactly it takes the negative of what we got now by the way if the speed is negative it makes it positive you take a negative from negative so this so in that is, case there are two wrongs make a right you got it <laughs> <laughs> and then what we do is we add that delta back to x position we, we've got them back together in the D register. And if we go to the next slide, the first instruction there is to store that new position into the X position. So we've saved that. Now we're going to do the same thing with the Y. It's exactly the same. We're going to load up uh, into the D register the Y, go through, and um, let's see, uh, you know, check to see if we're still on the screen as far as the Y goes and branch if we are. If not, we do the same thing with the negative. Where, uh, yep, let's see, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, we do the same thing uh, as far as, you know, making the Y uh, negative, adding that new, um, you know, 
speed offset. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. And then speed adding offset. it to the existing yeah. Sorry. Position. Sorry. And a notice came on my screen going, okay, what? <laughs> and then we store it in the Y position. We're done. So we now knew, have the new X and Y position. Well, it's now time to calculate what that new X and Y position is on the screen. So we load up A with the top half of Y position, which is the whole number. Yeah, next slide, there you go. All right, yeah, on the next slide. Sorry about that, Stevie. Okay. Then we load up uh, the B register with the number of bytes per line. And then we use the multiply. So what we've done is we're trying to figure out where in screen memory is this particular position. And we've now got that. Uh, so when you, when, you multiply, when you multiply, it's always A times B? Yep. So you don't yep. have to specify which register? No. Yep. no okay. No. There's only one multiply. It's this one. So they just made it simple. So it's multiplying A plus times B, and then it's putting the answer in D, the okay. two, letter, two of them together. And so I add this screen. Remember that variable that we put together mm -hmm. in the direct page? That has our current screen. That's being added to the uh, what we've calculated. So we now have the position of the beginning of the scan line that is the position for this uh, particular dot. And then we transfer the D register into the X. So we now have an index register, which we're going to need later, pointing to that. All right, next slide. We now have to deal with the X position. And we actually kind of have to deal with the X position twice. First, we have to find the byte on that scan line that holds our dot. And then we have to figure out which one of those four positions in that byte is the dot. So we'll first grab the uh, X position. That's the whole number on the top. Divide it by two twice. So we get to divide by four because remember there is four bytes, four dots per byte. And the ABX, it adds whatever's in the B register to the X register. So and that, yeah, then it figures out the, the number of bytes from the left side of that current scan line the dot is supposed to go to. Exactly. I now, was just thinking the math would have been a heck of a lot easier if we had an eight bit wide dot that moved <laughs> one byte at a time. <laughs> why do you it wouldn't it wouldn't be moving a dot, it'd be moving a stick. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, like Stevie, if you remember there's that three hundred and twenty by two hundred or four hundred, whatever it was, graphics mode on the PC that was two hundred and fifty six color. Yeah, yeah. That's why they liked it. They didn't have to do any masking. The, the bytes just was, worked out. Every yeah. byte was a single pixel, so you didn't have to worry about yeah. masking. The calculations are easy. Yep. Yeah. That's why they did Not to give you 256 colors. It's just freaking easier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's um, go to the next slide, Stevie. All right. Now we have to deal with which particular um, bits within that byte do we have to deal with. So we load up B with the X position again. We and out the bits that we need to only worry about, which are the lower two bits that represent from zero to three for our four different positions. And then I multiply it by two. And the reason why I multiply it by two is remember earlier we had that data table that had uh, masking information and color. Mm -hmm. Well, that was two bits of inf or two bytes of information per dot. So what I do is I multiply by two, load up the, the location into the Y register, and that's what the load effective address mask color data comma PCR does. This allows us to figure out what that location is relative to the program counter, and it puts it into the A register. And this is an instruction that, uh, um, Curtis is very familiar with because this allows you to do things that are PC relative or program, you know, program counter relative, which is key to OS 9. Yeah, this is position independent code, which means if the program moves, this offset of where it's pointing to moves with it. So if I loaded the program, like Steve has this program loading at 3F00, if you wanted to move it to 7F00 because you got a 32K code code to try it on, 
then the program just automatically all works and shifts everything over. If you hard coded Y to point to a specific memory address yeah. and then you had to move everything, it's now pointing to whatever random garbage was still in the old address mm-hmm. and the new address, who knows? So it's, it's just, just a different way. I mean, I could have said load Y pound sign, uh, mass color data, and it would have gotten it. But this, this way here, it takes about the same length of time and it's, uh, uh, programmer counter relative code and that's what the PCR stands programmer counter relative and then we simply uh, remember we had built up that B register to point to uh, an offset into that particular table well Y contains the table and the B comma Y that load effect address B comma Y adds the B to it so we are now pointing at that location and, and like that. So that's basically what that's doing. Uh, we're getting very close to the end, folks, so hang in there. All right, remember before I talked about the fact that we had a dot on the screen, and well, if I didn't erase the dot, you would start having lines on the screen instead of dots because it would he just keep drawing the dots up there. Well, this first two in, or first three instructions, uh, we load up A with what was there. This was what was at the old graphics location before we had wrote the dot. We load up the U register. Curtis, don't get upset because I'm using the U register right here. No, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's U register is used for a lot of things in OS9. You don't want to destroy it. But anyways, uh, load up U with the uh, uh, the address of where that uh, location was that we had the graphics data and we simply store the old data onto that memory location with the store a at comma u it basically erases the old dot from the screen all right now we load up the a register with what was there and before we change it around whatever we store it at what was there i mean so we load up a with what's on the graphics screen that we want to change and we save a copy of it so we can erase it later. Simple enough. You got that, Stevie? Yep, 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 yep. Okay, next slide. Now, this here is how we mask. We simply do a and a with uh, the information that has to do with clearing out the bits that we're gonna change, so there's zero, and then we or in the bits of what's gonna be basically the color of that dot, and then we store it in the comma X, store A at comma X stores it on the screen. So we've only changed the dots that we wanted to that are, I mean, the bits that we want to that represent the dot and like that. And the last thing we're doing there is restoring X at dot memory that remembers where this particular byte was changed. So this routine not only puts the dot on the screen, but remembers what was there before so it can be removed later. So the anding is the masking and the oaring is the painting in. Yes. You got it. Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide. Now, if we were just simply going to go through and do this without any sort of time delays or try and sync it to the screen or anything, the dot would be moving so fast you'd probably never see it. If you do in basic, you would see it, but in assembly, you won't really see it because it's going to spend a lot of time just zipping across the screen and be a blur. So what I've got here is a routine that waits roughly a 60th a second. I'm going to use the extra strict count. The reason why is this number is larger than 256, which is the maximum you can count when you're using an 8-bit register. So we have to use a 16-bit register, which is the X register. I'm using this particular case. And the label, so we can have something to go back to, is called delay. And you simply say load, this load effect address, one, negative one comma X, is decrementing X by one. It's removing one from X. And we're just waiting until it shows the zero flag is being set, which is an equal instruction. But when the zero flag is not set, it is not equal and loops back to delay and keeps looping forever. So it's until, almost like a four next loop. Yep. 
Psychopornax loop, and we're just waiting. We're waiting roughly about the time. The reason why I'm using the numbers that I'm using, for example, is this particular delay function of subtracting one from X and branching if we haven't reached zero takes roughly eight clock cycles. So that's the reason why we have the clocks 60 hertz divided by eight. That's roughly how many times we want to go through the loop to wait for that 60th of a second to go by. Yep. And believe it or not, we would then branch up to the main loop and start the whole process over again of figuring out the new X position and moving the dot. And that's the program. <laughs> and basically, in start absolutely makes no sense unless you hear, think about it this way. The word end means this is the end of the program. Don't add anything after this. It, we're done. The word start after the word end says this is the entry point. This is where you go to the program to start. So that's why it doesn't, when you look at it, it doesn't make sense. But when you're an assembly angling wizard, it makes perfect sense to you. Okay, end start. No more code and set the start location. Yep. Simple as that. And believe it or not, that's my uh, effectively on the next slide is my last one. Lesson 12, we're going to look at uh, data objects. This is going to let us move more than one object on the screen. Uh, we're going to have three balls bouncing around. Neat. Yep. So that's just definitely. to reiterate, since I've been out for the last couple of weeks, you're using the setup that Paul Piscarelli is using, which is uh, yeah. the tools. Yeah, exactly. And... Uh, Notepad++? Plus plus. Yep. yep. Yeah, I, actually, I've got the source code right now p pulled up on the screen, which might make it look a little bit better than it did in the in the slide format. But this is what you'll be able to download from Steve's link, is the uh, ASM file, which is the assembly language source code. And then there's also a disk file that um, would um, let you inject the program onto that disk. So um, it's pretty cool. And if you don't mind, Steve, what I'd like to show is just how easy it is to actually assemble this and run it in VCC based on Paul's setup. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so right now this is the source code in Notepad++, and there's the language definition that color codes the, uh, the commands and the, the variables and the comments, right? So all your different tab stops are, um, are the, different, the different syntax components here have different colors to them right so mm -hmm. visually it makes it a lot easier to see and yeah so i mean it's not a huge program but like you're saying it's so it's 180 some odd lines of code and um pretty short program and that includes all the various comments and everything else so you would use notepad to to create your assembly code in this case here you're gonna be able to download it so you don't have to type it from scratch this is not the rainbow magazine uh, so, <laughs> so then what you would do is, um, uh, and this is all, again, this is based off of Paul Fiscarelli series, uh, Long Branch Never, but you have your, your one directory that's your 6809 assembly code and you have a, a program called assembat, right? So you type in assemb, that's the assembler batch file. In this case here, we're going to type in dot move, which is the assemb file. And then here we could pass it off to VCC or I could pass it off to MAME for that matter too. So in this case here, I'll pass it off to MAME. So now the assembler's running. It's now injecting everything. Unknown support type MAME. Oh, I forgot about that. It's not MAME. It'd be like Coco 2. You know, type in MAME, whatever. I'm getting all these freaking errors <laughs> popping up <laughs> there. That's because I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. Stop giving me all this freaking God. You got to quit out of MAME. There we go. It, it finally went away. All right, so what is it? It's not main, but it'd be like Cocoa 2B, right? Or Cocoa 2, right? Or I should have just typed in VCC. Um, and here it is. So I'm going to move the screen over. It's still loading main, loading machine. Okay, so this loads up main, and now it's loading in the, uh, the file. And it would have been faster in VCC at this point. But here it is. Here's your dot move. And now the, the, the ball is bouncing. So... The moral of the story here is, though, is with this with this setup, you have you have the you have the uh, the Notepad, which is your editor. Uh, you type it in, you save your file, then you type in assemb space, the name of your assembly file, and then you follow that with the emulator you want to push it out to VCC or MAME or or XROR. Um, and the ball's bouncing, and we can see here it's bouncing smooth. Um, it's not blinking. There's no flashing effect on here. 
and it is not like Curtis was saying it's not doing 45 degree angles right so it is it's pretty nice how it's going um, I should this, mention too this is greatly slowed down because of that time delay Steve put in I mean if you took that sucker out you'd barely be able to see this thing right right so if I did the same thing and instead of typing in Coco 2 if I just typed in VCC it would actually probably run a little bit faster and you would get without that disk noise too which is still worth getting from MAME right so here's the VCC version of the file and then boom 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 it's just bouncing that double wide pixel because I've maximized it now the aspect ratio has been distorted it's it's a, a rectangle instead of a square but you get the idea here so very quickly with the um, little series that Paul Fiscarelli has set up for us we can start assembling uh, pretty quickly and so all future lessons that we're going to do in this series will be using Paul's environment um, so good stuff very good stuff and one thing I want to mention, that there, there's a lot to take in in here because we're this is the first time we've been hitting like programming the SAM and the VDG and stuff, and, and maybe that's not totally understandable to people yet. I mean, basically, this program is set up for P-Mode 4, so we'll just leave it at that for now and, and get into the details later. But I, I think on, one nice thing for people that are just getting started in this, like I said, this might be a lot to take in in one shot, but just fiddle with some of the variables that Steve did the starting labels on. Change the angle, change the two deltas, change the start position so when you fire up the program, the dot starts a different spot change the time delay so you can make it run slower or faster. You can kind of figure out how the program works doing those things and seeing what the effects are. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, like if I wanted to really set it up a little nicer, the the mount that I was uh, setting up for the deltas, the speed for the X and Y, I should have defined those at the beginning. That way you would just change variables at the beginning opposed to somewhere in the middle of the code if you want to change how fast the ball moves. That sounds like a, an objective for the user to try. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Set up a variable called something like uh, init x speed or whatever, and you can put that in. But you know, it's uh, basically it's just something to play around with. Now, when we get into later the series, I'm going to be talking more about the stuff that I've added to the program that's new opposed to going through the entire program every time. So you will need to kind of realize these are going to build upon the foundation from the previous episodes. Yeah, so we have we have Paul Fiscarelli giving us hello world where we can put text on the screen and we have now Steve Bjork saying hello Pong. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Eventually this will become a Pong game. Yeah. And next week's lesson, which we're going to talk about how to create uh, data objects. This is more advanced versions of variables that allows you to have code that's reusable. Uh, ha you know, like if you want to have, let's say, um, oh, I don't know, uh, you want to have three balls bouncing on the screen once, you only have to have code for one ball. And with the fact that you've got a data structure or a data object for each individual ball, they're, they can run independently and you don't have to do that much work and I'm all for not doing that much work these days <laughs> <laughs> spoiler alert this is the secret of Steve Bjork's programming <laughs> <laughs> yeah later we're going to get into how we create the um, how we fire up the objects and like that and I'm, I'm going to teach you how to become your own version of a god Ooh. Actually, you actually have a routine called god that spawns <laughs> all the objects in your game, and that gets to be fun. I don't. Think um, I I would just like to say I'm a little bit offended by the term God. Um, so if, uh, <laughs> if we could okay. change that to something how, else. How about <laughs> just spell it backwards well, then it's yeah. okay. Uh, if you use David Ladd, I would completely be okay with that. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Bruce Moore has joined us. D. Bruce Moore. Paul Fiscarelli is here. Polly Walnuts is in the house. We are all here. Um, hey, Bruce, we, I was going to take a, a break. Would now be a time before we start to break, maybe to start to break with the video you gave me today? Sure. Sure? Yep. Uh, that's an emphatical yes? A absolutely. Okay. Uh, i got to find it again now, so bear with me here. Just a second here. Yes, 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 yes. Um, that's, you put it, was that in the creator space? I, I don't know. <laughs> Come on, Bruce. It said Bruce. <laughs> yeah, so it's Coco Forever Season you 4 is complete, right? You expect that, us to remember this stuff? Is that the file, Bruce? Sounds right. All right, so we're going to try this. Let's hope I don't screw this up. So Apparently check this I out, everybody. 
well, so... <laughs> Oops. Oh, it's way too late for What that. if, knowing what I know now, I could go back in time, join Tandy Corporation, and change the course of history? How does it feel? Coco forever! I'm still I, I haven't seen any of the other retro or even modern communities try to pull off something like this. This is unique. Switcheroo, the hottest selling cocoa product of 2018. CocoForever.gracenote.ca Ooh. You're saying the whole thing's ready for me to order finally. Yes, episode mm -hmm. nine is out, and for those of you who are binge uh, binge watchers or binge consumers, um, I've packaged it all up so you can get the whole thing all at once. Ah, I think I'll cool. do that. It's uh, about four hundred and I think it's four hundred and sixty megs all together for the whole thing. That's episodes zero, ten episodes numbered zero through nine. Excellent. I got a question for you. In the video you just showed, there was the um, subway shuttle system. Was that yes. the one at Tandy? Yeah, that's the actual Tandy subway system. Yeah. You you found video of it. That's great. I found video, and I found I found the guy who did it, and he gave me permission to use it. So yeah, it's the actual stuff. Wow. And it's integrated into the storyline too. So it's, it's, it's an integral part of the story. Wow. Wow. Um, well, we, we, Bruce, we have, we have at least one viewer who's with us today who has never seen an episode of Coco Talk before. So why don't you take a minute to explain the whole idea of what is Coco Forever for somebody who, you know, maybe is watching us for the first time or just to remind people who have been lazy like Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the uh, the concept, I, I guess, is it's okay. So this is a fictional thing. This is a story. It's a what if story. I'd been watching Back to the Future and introduced it to my kids, and then I got thinking Back to the Future for the Coco. What if you could go back there and change some of the the missteps that Tandy had made, and then uh, and you, know, you come back to the the present, and and Tandy would be you know the company, right? Of course, that never goes the way it's supposed to, and, uh, and so I, you know, I think I've got a, a, a entertaining story there. I've had a lot of members of the community uh, take part, um, either as alternate versions of themselves or, or just, uh, yeah, essentially alternate versions of themselves with with odd names. And as you know, Stevie, you were in the opening there, and uh, I think there's maybe um, there's at least a dozen. I think there's a dozen different voice actors. So it's it's. Uh, it's nine, it's 10 episodes, zero through nine. I think it tells a good story. It's it's a good lot of fun. And if you were disappointed that Ready Player One did not have the Coco in it, this is a, you know, story where it's all Coco all the way. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we and, use the term voice actors loosely. So yes. Well, hey, <laughs> when you're acting as yourself, it's actually pretty nice. I resemble that remark. Yes. <laughs> So their voice untalents? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I frankly, I love Jason's rendition of the security guard. It's just, it's just, it's actually perfect for a security guard, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of my favorite lines from it too is, uh, Oh, I'm much happier breaking stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we should probably point out that it is mostly an audio drama. So it's something people listen to. Also. But it it also is a kind of a mixed media augmented reality thing where there is content to look at as in PDF documents and JPEGs. There are some interactive programs you run on the Coco that, that yeah. mix it. So it is, um, as, as Curtis said in the trailer, it's something like the retro community has never seen before, literally, right? So... Yeah, it's a sort of I'm going for an immersive kind of experience. So, you know, uh, uh, Rainbow Magazine covers, you know, that could have happened in an, you know, in an alternate timeline. There's yeah. Those, you know, uh, gee. And so, and, you know, there's there's that. And then there are interactive parts as well where um, you need to run it on your cocoa. And it, it's 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 more like one of those. Um, what do they call them? 
uh, pick a path adventure books or something like that. Yeah, okay. choose your own adventures. Yeah, choose your own adventures. Yeah, where you you have several options and it you know takes navigates you through the story. And I mean, if you if you miss that, you're not gonna it's not gonna wreck the story, but it does definitely give you some background details to to enhance the whole fun of the story. So value added there now one one thing we should mention too I, I, correct me if i'm wrong in this but the the interactive coco parts they're coco one and two compatible you don't require coco three or anything everything runs That's on the right. older yeah yeah they'll run on the uh, base the baseline coco absolutely okay. very cool well we're very grateful for having uh you contributing to our community as we are with everyone else as well so that's very cool stuff all right so now that we've talked about that coco forever the entire series is able to be downloaded and binge and you should we should also mention there is a there is a financial cost associated with this too so when you go to cocoforever.gracenote.ca you purchase this um so go to the website you can buy individual episodes or you have a bulk download now or you can get the whole thing yeah there you go so it's yep. kind of the uh, costco philosophy if you buy it in bulk you uh, save some money that way All right so <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, if you get the whole thing at once, it's like uh, twenty bucks. I, I don't know. I think it's I think it's pretty good entertainment value for twenty bucks. I think. Right, right. Yeah. It was Absolutely. a lot of work, so I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very cool. All right, so we are going to now go ahead and take a break, and then we'll be back. Uh, hopefully, Rick Adams is still awake, and we can um, get we can talk about what he's working on. And we got yes, yeah, so this is going to be a very software heavy uh, episode of Coco Talk, but that's not a bad thing, right? We're just no. going to break it up just a little bit. So we'll be back after these words, everybody. Hi, I'm David Ladd. Thank you for watching Stevie Stroh. It's not. In a world where RGB produces black and white video. One cable can make a difference. Switcheroo. Coco3scartcable.com What's going on, guys? Stevie Stroh here, and I want to say thank you so much for being part of this adventure with us. It's been thank such you. a great yes, experience in doing Coco and Talk thank every you. week, and the support we get is just amazing. And so the fact that you watch and listen is all the reward that we need. However, if you would like to become a patron of the show and offer some financial assistance towards the production and hosting costs of the show, we do have a Patreon site available for that. And you can reach that by going to our website at cocotalk.live and clicking on the Patreon link. But just do us a favor and watch and listen to the show. Where can you catch all the latest news and information about the Daily Color Computer and Compatibles? Oh yeah. I'm talking about the Coco Crew Podcast. Dig it each month. Join John, Neil, and Mike as they lay down the latest news and information about the Radio Shack Tandy Color Computer and Compatibles. Move to interview. Tech segments and discussions all about the Radio Shack Tandy Color Computer. Strut your fine self over to www.cococrew.org and start listening today. The Coco Crew Podcast. Keeping it Coco. I don't need that report tomorrow. Great, JT. I need it tonight. But, JT... Fletcher saved $300 on her office away from the office. Radio Shack's revolutionary Model 100 computer. It's a word processor, phone directory, and dialer. It even communicates with the office computer. Fletcher, how's that report? Fletcher. Radio Shack's Model 100. Save $300 and put it to work. You'll go far, Fletcher. <laughs> You'll go far. We now return you to Coco Talk. 
All right, Fletcher. Where is Fletcher today? That should be a segment. Anybody know Fletcher? We got to get her on the show and say, <laughs> <laughs> Fletcher, how far did you go? <laughs> uh, Stevie, before we go on too far, we did have at least one comment in chat, and it had to do with the fact that uh, the direct page variables kept the program from being um, relative. And no, that's not necessarily true, especially in the case of OS9. Uh, you mean uh, as far as keeping it position in independent? Exactly. Okay. So direct yeah. page does not modify the fact that it's still position independent code. Right, exactly. Yeah. And it was, in OS9, if you fork a process, especially under OS9 level one, it'll actually give each process its own unique direct page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Just want well, to make sure they were understanding what was going on there when we were talking about uh, relative code. Okay. Okay. Well, I want All to right. say thank you, Steve, for now 11 great episodes of Learning Assembly because um, I'm not, I'm probably not the only person who says, you know, I wish I learned it back then. I always wanted to as a kid and I never did. And if only, you know, <laughs> if only there was someone out there who could, you know, teach us this thing. And, and luckily we, we, we have these people in our community like yourself and, and Paul Fiscarelli and we have now Rick Adams project is going to be sharing his source code with his current project, letting you be a fly on the wall to what it's like to be, a, you know, develop software like a rock star. So, <laughs> uh, good stuff. And so I guess this next part here, we're going to make it a multi-purpose, um, core dump All right <laughs> and is that okay with you nick morentes uh yep yeah, no problem we're gonna let rick um lead this thing off but before we get started because this is a professional show we do have a little segment uh infographic here to let everybody know we're about ready to have a core dump so get ready for this folks get ready for core dump Discussions, solutions, and brainstorming hosted by Nick Marentes with special guests this week, Rick Adams. All right, so the core dump is about to begin. So how about we start? How about we start with uh, Rick Adams? Tell us what you've got going on right now, Rick. Well, it's, uh, it's really kind of timely that we were looking at a bouncing dot earlier uh, because I have an assembler program that does dots moving around uh, that I've been working on. Uh, basically, this is the, the very, very bare beginnings of what I'm hoping will be Temple of ROM version 2. And I'm starting it very slowly and uh, uh, very methodically. And I've got no uh, timetable. I can do it as slow as I want, and just for fun, uh, I'm opening up the process so that anybody can watch me as I develop this. So all my source is on uh, GitHub, and so you can go out there and get it, and you can you know get in on the ground floor, and it it's barely doing anything right now. So it's moving dots around, but it's not. Uh, it doesn't look like anything like uh, what Steve had. So let me turn this around and show you here's what my program is doing right now so oh dots are moving from left to right across the screen right and but you're also masking out the background or foreground depending on what we're looking at here yep so uh what this is is i have just now uh, the latest thing i've added to the program is that uh, uh it does double buffering so ah. there are two two screens in memory at, uh, at once, and it's drawing on one screen while it's displaying the other screen. And then uh, right at the vertical trace interval, uh, which is when it's just starting to paint the screen, it flips and you know the, the screen that was just painted gets displayed, and then I clear and paint on the other screen. So they just sort of flip back and forth. Um, that smooth animation. So oh, it's smooth. very, it's very smooth. It's like but butter. It's very, but it's yes, but it's very slow. And so what this shows me is that uh, the design of this program is naive. Um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, because I assume that uh, it's like, uh, well, you know, I've got a 6309. I'm doing it in 6309 native mode. So I'm going to get about a 10% speed boost. Hot dog. I am loaded for bear. Uh, but, you know, the, the cocoa giveth and the, the cocoa taketh away. I've got a, uh, uh, a larger, res- uh, a more, uh, you know, cool resolution than I had before. Yeah. So it's more memory. And as a matter of fact, the, the last uh, problem that I had to solve was the fact that you can't fit two screens in memory because it's just too big. There's not enough room in memory at any one time in your 64K map for, uh, you know, two screens and your program. So I had to, you know, uh, use the uh, memory management unit, the MMU, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and, and use that to, uh, to map in, you know, one screen and then the other. Um, so I'm not real good at the MMU. You know, I, I figured out just enough to get it to work for like Shanghai. Uh, but I didn't really understand how it worked. And now I understand a lot better. But, uh, so at this point I need to restructure this program. Uh, and I mean, I could think about, uh, a less high resolution which would be, uh, you know, less screen size and mm-hmm. faster to process. Uh, I've got to figure out, you know, what goes in the uh, uh, the interrupt routine and uh, all kinds of things like that. What so resolution are we looking at now? Is this the 320 or the 640? Yeah, it's, it's the 320 by 225. Oh, okay. And six, 16 colors. Because I wanted to use a 16 color mode. And, I'm I'm tired of, of four colors. Sure, I want sure. a little bit more. So, as long as you this cocoa three only. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Thirty five years a, later. I I got a question for you, Rick. Uh, sure. The way that you're erasing the dots off the screen is that by copying the entire screen back in? Uh, yeah. So yeah. basically, for, for each, it's very naive, as I said. So mm-hmm. for each frame, I erase the entire screen. And then I draw it all from scratch, including... Oh, the the yeah, that explains a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's not doing draw, redraw at all. So, right. Well, based on that, then that's, you know... And literally each screen right. is almost 36K, so I mean, that'll yeah, tell you how much pretty, memory it's yeah. moving around. Well, well, Rick, you've seen my Z89, right? Uh, Z89? Yeah. Oh, that's is that like the, the Zaxxon thing? That's the Zaxxon for the Coco 3. Right. Sure. Now, on that game there, when you play it, not only did I use the, instead of the 320 dot across mode, I used the 256 dot across mode, but sure. I also windowed it. I made it smaller because Ooh, I constantly yes. had to redraw the screen because we're scrolling at yep. that weird angle. Mm-hmm. And, and that was required. That's just the way you have to do it. There's no way to do a 320 by 200 screen and redraw the thing every game frame it there's just you're going to be looking right. at about 12 frames per second at best right yeah that's even so with a goal, 609 <clears throat> so so the goal at the at the end of the line here if i can make this work which is debatable is to do a temple of rom that does sprites instead of uh vertical and horizontal lines Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a little bit fancier than the old version. Um, And so I've got a long way to go here. Well, the question is, how many sprites and how big are they going to be on the final game? Right. Well, the sprites are going to cover the entire screen. But the sprites aren't going to be, uh, you know, the the sprites are going to be at least 50% black. Mm -hmm. So so there is that. Right. Now, the one thing that I just did, somebody was suggesting that uh, uh, I wasn't doing a stack blast for the clearing of the screen that I'm doing. Uh, and I've, I've tested uh, the, cl- the clear the screen routine. I set the border to red at the beginning and mm-hmm. set it to black at the end to see how much of the 60th of a second am I taking up with the clear the, uh, routine. Mm-hmm. And the answer is all of it and then some. Yep. So, <laughs> yep. Uh, so um, I redrew uh I, rather i redid the, the uh, clearing the screen routine and so that is over here mm-hmm. and to make it a little bit more efficient 
and let's see if it'll if it'll ever stop being blurry. It will not. It's not going to be. That's, that's fine. That's really, that's, uh, yeah. that's copy. It's copy protection. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's encrypted. That's what it is. Yeah, it's macrovision. <clears throat> so. <laughs> Well, that's anyway, the thing. It, it, well, well, one of the things that's going to suggest is you're going to have to look at it. And there's two ways of doing it. You can do right. a complete screen blast to erase all your graphics and put the the new new graph, the base screen back up there and put the new graphics on top of that. Or you can do something that's basically a save a copy of what was underneath the sprite, and then what yeah. you do is you just erase that back in. Now that's what I did right. on Rampage. Mm-hmm. So you just had the gorillas uh, moving around. Uh, basically, the way the game worked as far as doing the graphics, if there was changes to the buildings, I did those. Then I did the uh, sprites on top of it. And even though I had pretty big characters in Rampage, I was still able to get a pretty good frame rate out of it. But it was not, um, you know, it basically store When I drew the graphics up at the same time, I was making a copy of what was on the screen, similar to what I did in the program where I had what was there, you know, for the dot, I saved that, put the dot up. And when I went to erase it, I transferred it back on. It's something very similar to that, but it's a list and you, you build up the list one way and then you run backwards and that erases the information off the screen. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like a combination of, uh, you know, double buffering and raw redraw. You got um, it. Yep. Yeah. So yep. that makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> Bomb Threat uses r draw, redraw. It's just one screen, and I just, you know, draw things as, as you go. And there is a little bit of a flicker. So, mm -hmm. okay. So it's going to be, yeah. So obviously, uh, the idea that you can clear the screen for each frame and redraw everything completely from scratch uh, is naive. So... Well, I wouldn't see naive. It's a way that's done on most systems. It's just the Coco is so slow compared to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the 609 will help in some spots in that, but there's also like design considerations to do too. Like right now you have the entire screen being viewed as, as the game itself. On the actual mm -hmm. final product, you'll probably have a section at the bottom for score and number of men left and everything else that you don't have to redraw right. every single frame. So you'll save some time there because you'll only be updating that, you know, as the score changes or the number of men changes. So. Well, that's mm -hmm. the thing. It was Z89 did exactly that. It had your score, your fuel, and all these other gauges and information up there. So it made the window even smaller that you had to right. refresh every time. Yeah, so there's right. little tricks like that you can do. You can put a border around like Steve did on Super Pitfall, and mm -hmm. I might have done on Zach's Z89 as well. And, and, then on, tricks. and then this is just sort of a proof of concept that I'm doing, and it isn't really... It's like the line drawing is completely naive. It's like it, you know, it's like for it's I brute force by dot. <laughs> it's brute force by dot, exactly. It's PSAP. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and if you were doing that for real, you would have uh, a vertical line routine and a horizontal line routine that would be optimized for drawing that kind of a line. And yeah, we did that in Nitrous be, 9, and holy cow, did that make a big disk speed difference? Like, yeah. multiples of speed, not just like 1.5. Which is what the original Temple of Rom did. So that's why everything is vertical and horizontal lines. You know, I could I knew how to do diagonal lines, but it it took too much time, <laughs> so I couldn't do it. So, are you planning on are you planning on the game still being kind of vector art for the temple itself, or are you going to be a little bit more uh, embellished than just the outline of well, the temple? I was thinking that it was going to be completely, you know, filled in sprites, and now it looks like well, that's probably not going to be possible. Well, so you, when you say, when I hear the word sprite, I'm thinking of the foreground character, but you're talking about for the background, would that be more like tiles, oh, yeah. like tile-based? Tile. Yes, okay, yeah. that's the buzzword I'm looking yeah. for, yeah. Um, so tile-based, and are you, you going to do hardware scrolling too? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try, I think. Uh, it seems like if you're going to be scrolling around, you know, in, in all dimensions, like Temple of Rom did, which was kind of its tour de force, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you could do that with hardware scrolling, uh that would be really nice. Now, I don't really know enough about that in, yet to be able to do that. So it'll be interesting to, uh, to, to learn that. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I'd like to tap into one day, too. I'm, I'm way, way not ready for that part yet. But no, that's cool. Um, 
how are you um, copying the screens? Uh, I'm just completely, I'm not copying at all. Uh, oh. I'm just completely clearing the entire screen and redrawing it from scratch every frame. Oh. Which, how are you clearing you the know, screen? Um, with a stack blast. Uh, or TFM yeah. if you're a six or a nine, if I remember correctly. I did try that. I did that and that worked. Uh, but now I'm doing a stack blast. I, I've heard that it is faster than TFM. Yeah, if you're just doing a clear, a stack blast is even on the six through nine is a little bit faster than 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 using a TFM. But if you're copying screen data, then a TFM is faster than any stack blast can be. Right. Okay, that makes sense. And one other trick but, I wanted to mention that like King's Quest three and some of the Sierra games use is that it's actually drawing a three twenty mode screen, but it's treating it like a one sixty, exactly like Steve did with his his bouncing ball, where he's treating it as a four color screen when it's really a two color mode. Because mm -hmm. then you can take all the masking of having to do the foreground and merging pixels with the background stuff, and you can just trash all that because you're everything's a single byte. Like we were mentioning before, the VGA like two fifty six colors. What's one byte per pixel? Well, you're just uh -huh. doing two pixels at a time. You treat them as a, a double pixel. And then you don't have to worry about all the masking stuff. You're just drawing raw bytes at a time. Right. You get your virtual res will be 160. It'll look like the 160 mode, but all the calculations are much simpler. Mm -hmm. Defcon 2. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would imagine a lot, a lot of discussions on Discord will be taking place as you continue to hammer this through, right? So Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's just so many different ways of doing it. It's trying out, trying to find which way works for the, the type of game you're doing or a program. It's just mm -hmm. trying to figure it out in the end. All right. But you know what I love about it, Rick, is there's many things I love about this. Number one, you're sharing it. Yeah. Number two, you, even though you have done things in the past, um, you, you're doing new things. You're entering uncharted territory, and so you're basically not bashful about enlisting help from the community and i just think that's a right. testament to both your lack of ego as well as the community all coming together just wanting to brainstorm and, and help you you know make this so it's right it's very awesome and that's the thing and, and that's the thing i'm going for maximum fun you know it's yeah. like you can have fun or you could make money or you could do some combination of the two mm -hmm. and th for this one i'm going for maximum fun so uh and I did this stuff a long time ago, and then I didn't wasn't doing it for a long time, and now I'm going back into it again. So I pick it up pretty fast because I did it so long ago. But you know, I don't know everything yet, um, and I'm okay with that. Uh, so you know, I've you know, I don't I don't care that that people are watching me struggle. You know, sure, sure. Yeah, well, it becomes a group learning project rather than you just yeah. trying to learn this stuff. Everybody gets to learn from it. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure I'll discover new things that I haven't tried before either. So, right, I'm I'm really kind of hoping to lure people in because I'm you know I've I've barely started. Uh, you know, people that's like you know, can I do assembly? Or I'm just starting to do assembly. How does one do this stuff? Uh, if I can lure people in to look over my shoulders and watch me do it and learn along the way, that would be awesome. Well, you're doing it already. This is great. Yeah, that's it. Well, so, I, think it's, I think it's a lot of fun, and I like more people to have fun. So, mm -hmm. you know. It's I'm, like I'm, the wizard I'm, showing what's behind the curtain. Yeah. Right. Yep. While sewing the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> While yeah. gnawing on the curtain. Yeah. I'm really disappointed at how slow those dots are. I'm, I'm really surprised. But, you know, then I look at my program, and it's like, okay, I got, you know, pro, I got subroutines calling subroutines calling subroutines and i got one dot at a time and all kinds of stuff it's like i thought i had all the time in the world to, to draw this frame but no, no that's not true no 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 <laughs> that's that's the thing <laughs> about the coco 3 is that you jump from that 6k screen to a 36k screen you just start to realize how hard it is to push that memory around yeah. I mean, you've doubled your CPU speed, but you've increased your screen size by 600%. So, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a net loss. it's a factor of five. You really have gone five times more memory to move around. So, yeah. you're right. actually going uh, two and a half times slower. So, it is, a little bit, it is a little bit tempting to go for a less elite uh, resolution. That would solve a lot of problems. But I don't know if I have to do that yet. I really... I love this resolution. I, I may or may not be able to keep it. 
Well, there's other tricks too. I mean, like one of the advantages I haven't used to use is in basic for the extended or for the Cocoa 3 is that there's tricks you can do in the Cocoa 3 you can't do in a Cocoa 1 too. So if you want to animate flames or something, you know, just shift palette registers around type thing, which takes almost no time at all. Whereas on oh, yeah. a, a, a straight bitmap, you'd have to be redrawing these flames or water or whatever right. it is every time. So there's other tricks you can do to speed it up or give the apparent increase in speed. And only change right. the things you need. Don't change everything. Yeah. Right. right. The victory screen in uh, Shanghai did that with the palette animation. Yeah. Or the that, waterfall demo that we've seen, you know, reposted. Right. Yeah. Recently. So you may really not need. Isn't... Sorry. Go ahead, Nick. Really... You may not really... need. To... You may not need to uh, copy and everything of the whole screen. Right. Uh, like exactly. uh, Curtis said earlier, I mean, you devote part of the screen to be your static areas like the score display. That, that'll that shrink the size of the screen. So then you straight away got less memory to, to play with. So there's a speed up without reducing the resolution of the overall game. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what you really need, Rick, is scores where the uh, digits are yay tall, where they're taking up about uh, three quarters of the screen, and that really cuts down the amount of graphics you have to. Yeah. Scoreboard exactly for the like playing Doom or, or sorry Castle Wolfenstein on a two eighty six, where you have the little postage side stamp thing because that's the only thing I could handle. Right. Yeah. So at this point, for me to optimize this thing that I this proof of concept that I have to make these little dots move faster would in, uh, you know would involve. Uh, a lot of work optimizing code that I'm going to throw away down down the line. So at this point, I need to go for uh, drawing sprites and drawing them as fast as I can and starting to put sprites on the screen. And then after that, I can work on uh, uh, scrolling them in all directions. Yeah. So, I mean, I you've mean, seen Thexter, which I, I mean, it runs under OS 9 even faster than the original cartridge version did, and that's scrolling almost the entire screen. But it's using little, little speed up tricks like we've been discussing. So, and it doesn't run at too bad of a frame rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Even if you're even pulling off a Thexter look for Temple of Rom would be actually very cool. Uh huh. So I have a question, which is, um, so obviously it, it looks like the uh, clear, uh, clearing the entire screen takes more than a sixtieth of a second. So, is that always going to be true? It's just always going to take maybe about you know three or, you know two, three uh, screen cycles. Well, you're killing thirty six thousand bytes if you're using a TFM. That's three cycles per byte. So we're whatever the math is, and that's over one hundred eight thousand, I think, CPU cycles. Mm -hmm. um, if you use stack blasting, I'd have to figure out. It depends on how many registers you're pushing on the stack, and then how long your compares take to figure out when you're done your stack blast. Are you doing the full width of the screen so you can just keep zipping along without having to change it, or are you doing a central part where you have to like stop after the line's done and then skip it up to the next line? And nope. There's a lot of yeah. a lot of variables you got to figure out right. in that first. Yeah. Well, one of the tricks I used when I was developing the games is. You know, I'd always try and go the fastest frame rate, but some games I couldn't go faster than every third frame I would switch. And then I would lock it down to that speed. So mm -hmm. every game cycle was three uh, frames. So that's what really what I would do is start thinking about what you can get it down to and then lock it to that speed. That way right. you're not going to have the thing speeding up and slowing down, which is yes. the most annoying thing to a game player. Yeah, <laughs> correct. You'll make Stevie never get past level zero. <laughs> You'll make him DEFCON quick, but... Uh, I'm good with title screens and game over screens. <laughs> yeah. and, and to be honest, I mean, for the Coco, I don't know if 60 hertz should be the holy grail anyway. I mean, we were dealing with NTSC, right. which is only doing every odd line, every second refresh. You're really doing only 30 frames per second to begin with anyway. People have watched movies for 100 years that are only running at 24 frames per second, so it's... I, I, it doesn't isn't that critical to get it going quite that fast? So maybe right. just don't worry about no. it. Yeah, my my nice. goal my goal is always to do something closer to uh, thirty frames per second. Anyway, so it's just mm -hmm. I know how much work it's going to involve, so I just do it that way. Yeah, and, and good, quite a few games did pretty well with other even divisions like fifteen and twenty. I don't think I'd go probably below fifteen for an arcade game, but fifteen mm -hmm. or twenty actually doesn't look that bad either. It'd just be nice to know the scale that I'm dealing with. It's like clearing the screen. Is going to take n screen cycles. It's like, what is the value of n? I don't know. So, 
Well, the one one, one example you're using, one. 320 by 225, using the 6-3 on TFM yeah. command, it's 108,000 cycles. Stack bus would be a little bit faster, depending on how many registers you're pushing at once. Mm-hmm. And then you take, you know, there's a million seven hundred eighty thousand cycles in a Coco three running at full double speed, divided by that amount. That tells you how many frames you take, or you can generate per second just clearing the screen, not drawing anything else on top of it, not doing sound, not right. doing gameplay. Yeah, but, yeah. I, my my brain can't do that calculation right now. <laughs> well, it looks cool so far. We're looking forward to seeing more. We will we will right. watch your career with great interest. <laughs> Twenty by two hundred. Like, does it, the game require it? Uh, it would be nice. I mean, the, nice, the original but... game. Yeah, the original game was almost full screen. So, uh, but you can do full screen, but choose a yeah. lower resolution. You can pick a resolution that's half the size. Right. Right. And still be full screen as such, you know. Okay. Yeah, like like you're yeah. doing with yours and on yeah, guns. Exactly. I mean, I I have the same problem. I can't do a full 36k screen, so I went for one that's uh, half the resolution, effectively. But you mm-hmm. know, the, the pixels are automatic, automatically double sized. Mm-hmm. So, so I may have to go for a lower resolution. Uh, I like but keep the color resolution, because to be honest, the color makes more of a difference visually, I yeah, think, than the number of pixels. I really want 16 colors instead of four. I, I really have to insist on that. So yeah. I may or may not be, you know, I may be backing off on this resolution. I, that makes me a little bit sad, but uh, we'll, we'll see. No, you just I'm have to make gonna... a viewport that doesn't use the whole screen. Like, uh, right, there's... right. Yeah, yeah, or, or not worry about 60 frames per second, worry about 20. Right. If exactly. that runs smoothly. Like how, how fast did Temple of Rom run? I don't think it was 60 frames per second, was it? I, I have no idea. I just put it together and it worked. I, I didn't measure <laughs> anything. Can we put well, you on that? that? Well, that's the thing is maybe for now, don't worry too much about what's going on. Let's get the stuff up on the screen, what you've got. And then we back off, take a look at, is it right. better to clear the entire screen first and start over? Or is it better to restore the screen? Right. And, because you have much, because you may only be transferring a thousand bytes every game cycle to restore the screen opposed to transferring 36,000. Right. Yeah. See what I'm doing now in this proof of concept really isn't relevant for what I'm going to be doing, uh, for the project. Uh, because the project is really all about drawing things and then scrolling it like crazy. So that's a completely different problem. So I need to start working on that problem as opposed to this one. Yeah, I mean, depending on the size of the map, I mean, if yeah. you make the game 512K, you could literally have the entire map in memory completely rendered already and just blast that, just do a copy. You're not clearing anything. And then just yeah. blast it on and then overprint your sprites and restore, as, as Steve said, because you have the entire map already expanded out graphically in memory and you just restore from those points wherever you're redrawing underneath the sprite. Right. Mm-hmm. And there are some techniques, depending on if you're trying to hor- scroll horizontally or vertically, you can do it in hardware scrolling too. Where yeah. you only have to d- build the part of the screen that's coming in, opposed right. to rebuilding the, the entire screen. So there, there's right. a lot of techniques. I mean, Marty's Nightmare, I just scrolled up and down on that game and didn't really worry about drawing that much stuff. So because... I don't know hardly anything about hardware scrolling right now, mm-hmm. which is great. This is an opportunity for me to learn. So mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. We just got to, now the thing is you can't do hardware scrolling where it's a simultaneously left and up. Let's say you right. can go horizontally, you can go vertically, but not both of them at the same time. Well, you you can to a limited extent. You have to enable that two fifty six byte mode, but that means you only get like in a three twenty sixteen color mode. You're only going to get about a screen and a half width that you can scroll back and forth on. You can go vertically right through all of RAM, but yeah. right, exactly. That's that's the problem. It's just if you're going to be scrolling, let's do say two or three screens to the left you can't do two and three screens also to the right i mean to above yeah now on the other hand if you drop the res say you did a 160 mode like you know predator or robocop did well then it's still a 256 byte wide mode you can actually get about two and a half screens i don't know if that's enough for what you're doing or not but that might be an option so the so i want 16 colors that's a big thing and then the other thing that i would really like and this is another area where I don't know enough yet to do this, but I know it can be done. I would like to have a more continuous sound. 
uh, possibly interrupt driven. Uh, Definitely. If, if you want it continuous, it'll be interrupt driven. Trust me. Yeah. Uh, Temple of Rom had this really wimpy sound that I just hated. It wasn't what I had in mind. You know, I had in mind when you when you fire that laser, I wanted to hear, you know, and I you, you just got this little. <laughs> when I was developing it, my kids were playing it, and uh, in this room in my house, and uh, I was coming up to the house, and I looked through the window, and I could see them playing it, and they're firing the laser, uh, and it just, I just had this idea in my in my head that it's like, yeah, yeah, that looks like, pew, 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 that looks great. And then I walked in the house, and then I heard the actual sound. It was like, it's like, and I'm like, oh, that is so pathetic. <laughs> I, I, both Nick and Steve can help you with that because they've done a lot of back-driven or uh, mm -hmm. background IRQ-driven uh, sound routines. And, and well, not, not only that, there's probably. all these new options of sound yeah. chips now for the Coco. I mean, we can have some stuff that's killer ass. Can you say that? Jonathan too. He's got yep. uh, he's got Beep. some code ready to go. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. So this is all. It's it's some areas where that's new to me, and I get to learn it, and possibly I can drag some people along with me, and they can learn learn it too. And I don't have to pretend to know everything. Uh, so it's all good. Yep. There you go. I really like the fact it's a it's a group project, a group learning project where everybody gets to learn along with you. Now, I've got it on my, my GitHub, but the GitHub has like a long, unpronounceable name, and I need to change that to something simple like Rick Adams. Right now, it's the GitHub of uh, Yggdrasil Radio. And it's like, well, good, good luck, uh, you know, uh, spelling that. That's the name of my online radio station. So we'll, we'll fix that to something simple. Cool. Cool. Well, it's humble, from humble beginnings, right? Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I'm very yeah. excited to see another yeah, Rick Adams. Slow. Yeah. I'm very excited to see another Rick Adams project out there taking shape. Uh-huh. Of course, now we got to finish Omnistar. <laughs> <laughs> of course, do we leave enough time for Nick? Yeah, we got time for Nick. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that don't, that don't yeah. take all the time. Yeah, no, I'm, I, was, I wasn't sure if Danny was just asking the question. That's all. Um, we got lots of time. You know, we got all the time in the world, and this is well, only I, this is only the first of nine shows we're going to do today. So, <laughs> yeah, only two hours. We yeah. all day long. So, for anyone who wants to follow this, Discord's probably the best place at this point. Uh, Rick has got links to where to find the source code on GitHub with the unpronounceable name. Um, I just posted he, it in the YouTube right. chat. Okay, and he's, there's also been an ongoing discussion yeah. already on some of this stuff too. So feel free to join in or just just follow along if you want to learn this kind of stuff yourself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, cool, cool. Well, we we will look forward to more and more updates on this, and you know, whenever you want to show us something new on the show, you know, you've got an open an open forum to do that. So uh, look forward to those updates. So we've had so many things premiere on this show, like like bomb threat that you're. You know, your project from a year ago now. It's hard to believe it's been a year since there was a Fun's bomb threat. Now, um, um, actually, I don't know if we've done an actual official premiere of uh, OmniStar yet, but we'll probably do for that in the near future, right? So, yeah, lots of premieres. So when when we're ready to give sneak peeks and premieres, uh, you know, we'll we'll do it. We'll yeah, do it live. Star Pilot debuted here too. So. Hey, Steve? Yeah. yeah. When you see when you see the latest version of OmniStar, uh -huh. there's sort of some surprises. Ah. And so if you play it, you're, you're going to see those surprises and it's going to spoil the game. So I wonder, well, I mean, I suppose I could turn that feature off and you could do a, you know, uh, a, a demo of it. But uh, when you see the, the latest version, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll take a look at that. Nick Morentes. Good night. <laughs> because we hijack your segment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all right. All, all I was going to do is just uh, show an update on Gunstar. I've been uh, creating the tile editor, or the map editor, I should say. Um, I think last time I said I got the scrolling and all that working. But at the moment, there's no 
none of the tiles are drawn, so it's just scrolling rubbish in memory. So I'm trying to put together um, a utility that allows me to um, create tiles and put them and, and map out all the levels, basically the background of, of, of each of the levels. So I've written a little, uh, as usual, I've written a little basic program as a tool for um, creating the level design. And uh, I'll just share a screen and just show you quickly in BCC. So bear with me. I will. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, now there's no sound, so we don't need to share sound. So there we are. So that screen's coming through. Yes, yep. it is. It's a basic program. Now it's, it's all in basic, so it's a little bit slow still. Um, I'll just run it and it's asking me to reload the tile set at the moment. I haven't actually drawn the tile set, so it's just going to work on rubbish that's in memory. Um, and uh, I'll just go with the defaults. But that's it there. Just It's just um, gray and white blocks at the moment. On the left-hand side, or the, the checkered area there that you can see on the left, that's where all the tiles will be displayed. So there's uh, 240 tiles and I can move my little cursor. You can see the cursor moving and I can choose a tile. Um, and then I can move across to the right hand side of the screen and my cursor appears. The right hand side represents the actual um, background graphics in the game. So um, the game itself is going to use a, a lower res and that's being shown on a higher res display there so um it, it, and it represents uh probably a two screens worth actually vertically two screens worth and um this is where i i i, I can stamp out all the tiles like i'll stamp a, a square there and well this i'll just go back and choose one of the the gray squares on the left and then i can stamp that out and you know, draw draw out my my um, background graphics. Uh, obviously, it'll look a lot better when I've got actual objects uh, to no, build. No, this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. Best graphics I've ever seen. So. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? So hopefully, um, hopefully in the next right. week and the lad, I'll actually have real tiles with objects. Yeah, that was where to call it, Gray Star. Yeah, gray star. That's right. And then I can build up the screen. And of course, every every um screen on the right, it'll it'll uh, represent. Uh, I can scroll. I'll be able to scroll that up and see an, a large vertical area of the background, which will in the game all scroll down. And that's where you fly your spaceship over. And you know. All right. So what there. are you calling a tile? Is a tile an entire screen, or is a no, tile no, one a piece tile of the screen? Is that little square you're seeing. The little square that my that flashing cursor is shown, that's a tile, one tile. If I move back to the left, see the square there? Yeah. Each of those squares is a tile, and there's 240 tiles. So there's 240 so, unique background shapes you can have. Background shapes, that's right. And all I'm doing is going to the right-hand side and, and laying them out to build the background graphics. For example, if I had, uh, say, a grass area, I would have on the left, I would have a tile that, that has, say, the grass, say, green. Uh, and then I'd move over to the right and I would just stamp out green. So, so um, I'll just pick, I haven't got many tiles and that that's what makes it hard to show. But, you know, if this was a green, I, I wanted grass, for example, I would just go ahead and draw the grass. Um, buildings and stuff i would build them up as tiles on the left and then on the right i would just stamp them out and gradually just build up the screen like a whole pile of lego blocks essentially i, I pick a lego block on the left and i yeah. put it I, in on the right and gradually build up an entire background i think i'm just having a hard time connecting dots on what's on the left and what's on the right right now as far as okay Left, left is a list uh, is a, a showing all the 240 unique background pieces Square. that you, okay. you can do. Um, the right, you put them all together, so you can have like five or six grass in a row going across, for example, to make. A so, strip. is is one tile? What is it? What is the pixel dimensions of one tile? Uh, eight by eight. 
do you have a file that you can load in that actually has some graphics? I no, think I would, no, that's that's what yeah. I haven't done yet. Yeah. So, oh, you're, okay. so, so you've just created the editor right now. We don't have any images yeah, to see in yeah. the editor. Yeah, and once I've now, got the the editor then i can use the graphics i can uh, that i'll draw and then up. what are we looking at the window on the right how many tiles makes up that window uh on the right is it uh, represents the actual uh, bitmap screen of the game and there are 24 tiles horizontally uh and then it's whatever number of tiles vertically really it, it, it can span several screens worth um Okay, so on your left hand side, I see I see ten blocks wide. Uh yeah, but the 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 uh, yeah, but each tile is what you're interested in. Each square that I'm highlighting is a tile. Let, think of a tile as a character set. So this is my character set, for example. So this is where I de define all the all the characters. I can put an A and a B and a C and a graphic blocks and all that. Mm -hmm. Just like, say, on a normal VDG screen, you've got your character set on your normal screen. Then you, you then pick those characters and you build the screen that you want, your, your main VDG screen. It's it's the same as uh, John Strong demonstrated for us, Stevie, if you remember his tile. And block yeah, no, I, under I understand what a tile is, but I guess I'm just not able to visualize it because there's no pictures here. I guess I need to no see pictures. the pictures. You yeah, pictures. Steve needs I need, pictures. I need pictures, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so oh, that's hopefully cool. next week I'll have some tiles. Uh, then you'll be able to visualize how the pieces go together. So currently that's what I've done. It's just a, a basic program which I use to build the, top, build the, the actual map um mm -hmm. and, and and the map will get yeah because like in uh, pop star pilot one tile could be like a piece of the ground uh or the yeah. palm tree or a piece of the building yeah. yes i mean exactly. i i, I that, yeah and I, that part i understand i'm just not connecting the dots between what i see on the left and what i see on the right so until until there's more colors and more pictures i can't fully process no. this so okay. I, I got you though yeah. 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 So this will make more sense when there's actual graphics in the tiles. Yeah. Um, Maybe right. show us next week more about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah oh, definitely. Graphics. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. That's right. So this is just what I've done so far. This is the map editor. Right. And this and is I've similar been... at this stage of this. Uh, this you're basically showing us a tool to create content. You just haven't created the content yet. So this yes, would be similar right. to like when you showed us the music player that had no music. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Because right. Nick really likes to wow us with things like that. Exactly. Here's something that might function. You've got to have the tool in order That's to That's it. Build yeah. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you speaking, my music composition tool. Speak, speaking of the tool, is this written in assembly or basic? This is all in basic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is impressive. Boy, that's a short program. No, just kidding. Yeah. yeah. Well,. That's it. Yeah. No. So far. Short. Well, it's, al it's almost done. The, the title is almost there. I haven't got the saver uh, option in there. So whatever I create, I'll just lose it if I well, don't. That, that, <laughs> that, that do explains it. why so he doesn't have anything to show us. He well, hasn't exactly. finished the freaking thing. This is <laughs> just the thing. Uh, and let me ask you, Nick, have you created a title screen for this uh, editor tool? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, well, sort of. <laughs> See? Map editor. Map edit, tile map editor for gun starts is the there very top. Go. So, yes, the, uh, that was the title screen. Because I usually like, <laughs> used to like to make title screens before we get into the actual program. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that was my feeling <laughs> when I was young. Still. Good. Yeah. Good on you, mate. That's so a good one. That's all. But uh, it'll make a lot more sef sense when I've got the, the tiles built. And then uh, you'll see the power of the map editor. <laughs> Uh, we had we had a question here from YouTube. Uh, are these ceramic or vinyl tiles? Are <laughs> <laughs> oh, you nothing but the best ceramic? There you go. Good to know. Or marble. I'm gonna try and. I'd like Ken uh, Ken uh, Reigert's uh, comment. I thought Gunstar would be more action packed. This looks like a puzzle game. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, 
Yeah, I, I think people are having a, a, a difficult time visualizing what the, the product will be. And it's, that, it, and yeah, that it's... there is, is another important skill for designing games. You can like, learn all about the 6809, but if you can't visualize what you're trying to create, if you can't see how all the pieces are going to come together, that all you will see is code. You won't see the game. Right, so right. Yeah, you've got to be able to visualize what where you're going uh, and then you need to build based on, on the, the code, the graphics and, and the techniques. That's what all comes together and makes the final product. So, yeah, this isn't so exciting, but it is all part of the building up to the game. Now, I think the moral of the story is it's hard to see what's not there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's not a good question. I do have a question for you, Nick, because you, you did a tile editor for Popstar too, did you not? Yeah, I did, yeah. You couldn't repurpose that that one? Well, the thing is, Popstar was a horizontal scrolling game, so the orientation is different. The, I think the uh, tile sizes were different. Oh, okay, um, so there's a few few differences. Yeah, there. there's a few differences, and uh, w w this one's been tailored to work with Gunstar, which is a vertical shoot 'em up mm. So, yeah, all the screens will be vertically aligned, um, and... Uh, I think I've got, yeah, well, the way I've mapped all the tiles in memory is a little bit different. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, every time you write a program, you know that, oh, well, I should have done this, should have done that, would have been quicker to do this. So the next program is going to be different. And it, it always has been different for me. So I haven't been able to repurpose any older code because I always have better ideas. Oh, I can do that better. <laughs> so it's always different. There you go. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, we've been very, very top heavy on software development talk today. And again, that's not a bad thing because we have been mentioning we need more software. We need more cowbell. So when it comes to what we want to see on a Cocoa, we want to see more software. So there's more and more people developing software. And now we have all these people who are going to be doing videos. And, and Rick Adams will be sharing his struggles as he works on his latest project. Steve Bjork's going to be continue to show us how to make things move on the screen. Paul Fiscarelli is going to continue his Long Branch Never series. So there's more and more opportunities for people to get the information and the resources they need to make software. And that's a good thing. Awesome. And on, on that note, I think it's time for the flush, isn't it? Uh, and this completes another core dump. Uh, Ron Delvo, how are things looking up there in the ISS? Uh, everything's just fluid. Fluid? Yeah. Are fluid. we coming through? Yeah. We're coming through the Roku satellite feed too. Yep. We are. All right. There we go. Yeah, Ron hasn't <laughs> been talking too much during this segment because he's been busy, you know, coding all of his new assembly games. So that's, that's correct. <laughs> he's been watching videos on the Taco. I know. Big reveal on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Grant. Yes. So with Nick saying that he's been switching sides with the his code from Popstar to this one, are you relational with this? Huh? What? Uh, uh, never mind. Bad joke. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a bad this... joke when you got to explain it. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or the punchline is, you get it? You get it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, not us. Oh Lord, have mercy! Uh, <laughs> oh, welcome, David. Right Lad, right? And hey, David Ladd, what have you been up to? Oh, I'm much happier breaking stuff. Oh, what that's been great. Up to? Well, I think you can kind of hear what I've been up to. David Ladd, I'm just fine breaking things. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, is it? If, if you want to really see David go at it. Catch him on Discord <laughs> when a telemarketer calls after nine o'clock at night. Oh. Why do you get an earphone? Oh uh, yeah, he was basically yeah, telling the guy what. Bring that up. You were telling the guy what he could do with his. Uh... MC ten. <laughs> That's eighteen oh, plus was, content. It I wasn't presume. just, you know, what he could do with his father, his mother, his sister. Boy. Oh, David. Uh huh. Has yeah. a bit of a potty mouth on him, does he? Oh, oh yeah. Not our and sweet, it's the innocent David. And situations he wants to put the telemarketer into. 
<laughs> uh, well, it, it just Sorrento depends style. on how flexible they are with their family. And that's it. So yeah. let's just say it was more it was more graphic than a week in uh, Facebook this week. So <laughs> Let, let's put it this way: when he threatened to come over to your house, he says, "Fine, I got the lube." <laughs> oh, and we just went to after dark there you go alright well we're going to take another break and then we'll be back and um, we'll see what else we can't talk about this week maybe we can now shift gears off of software for just a little bit but who knows so software is not a bad thing alright so we'll be back after well let me turn my um, sound sharing back on again so you guys can know when the commercial is playing alright we'll be back after these words thank you everybody thank you thank you thank you yes you're too kind and thank you alright so we'll be back hello I am the speech and sound pack and you are listening to Col Col Talk oh yeah do that again <laughs> It's me, it's Original Gamer Stevie Stro. You know, gameplay. To get your copy of a Gameplay Goodness gameplay. Color Computer Gaming DVD today, gameplay. head on over to 8bit256.com. There you will find several DVDs featuring Color Computer Gameplay videos by the Original Gamer Stevie Stro. So to get your very own copy of a Gameplay Goodness Color Computer Gaming DVD, head on over to the Retro Swag Shop at 8bit256.com and tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stro sent you. the Radio Shack TRS-80 put the world of color computing into your home. Instant loading program packs turn any color TV into an exciting game arcade. And there's more. The color computer is an educational aid, a home management tool, and up-to-the-minute electronic information service. The programmable, expandable TRS-80 color computer from $399 only at Radio Shack, the biggest name in little computers. We now return you to Col Col Talk. How does it feel? Having a hard time switching over. There we go. <laughs> we just switched over. A little delay there. Push the uh, button, Francis. Push the button, Frank. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Well, I don't know. I'm sure if Davy Mitchell's still out there in in the audience or not. But he did post something. Uh, we do have a little section in, in Discord for Coco Talk where if you want to post some suggestions on things to talk about in the show. So we try to make it easy for people to give us links and things that we might, you know, consider putting on a future episode. So one of the things that Davey gave us was uh, a link to a YouTube video that he posted on a Game for the Dragon. And by the way, Davey's Retro Corner is his um is his youtube channel uh i should post a link to this which i will when i'm done i'll post a link to this in the chat but uh so this is a game for the dragon that's called miser's dream by microvision for the dragon 32 and it's kind of an interesting game idea and and like like a lot of games on the dragon uh because they did not have artifacting um, they did not support those extra colors like we have. Um, most of the dragon games use the green background. And, um, but this is kind of an interesting game. It's kind of a puzzle game because the, the money is dropping coins and you have to manipulate seesaws to get the coins to go into different directions and catch them in your piggy bank. Oh, wow. A little bit loud. 
But if you kind of look at this, it's kind of neat. So it looks like you move this little doohickey around here, and this is where you change the directions of the seesaws um, and kind of tilt them which direction you want them to go. And then you also use that little doohickey to somehow catch the coins or, you know, do whatever you got to do. But it's an interesting game that's dealing with kind of, there's a puzzle element, there's some kind of motion dynamics to it, physics, if you will. Uh, so a couple of interesting things going on here. I had not seen this game before, um, but it's interesting, and it just shows you, gives you some ideas on, on different types of games you can do for the Coco. I don't know how many frames per second this one's doing. I would imagine it's not pushing 60 frames per second, but it, you know, in a puzzle game, you don't need to be super fast. Um, but it's just kind of neat, and it just goes through a lot of levels. But you can see here, he's doing what he's got to do to get those coins to make their way into the piggy bank. It looks like on the bottom of the screen is a meter, and you got to get that meter to come all the way to the other side, I'm assuming to end the level. That's each um, coin you collect, yes. Each coin you collect. So you have to collect a certain amount of coins to end the level. There's a looks like a countdown timer here, so if you spend too long, maybe you'll lose a life or lose a level, whatever the deal is. But I thought this was kind of interesting, kind of cute. There, This is just one example of the fact that we there are so many games for the dragon. I don't know how many. Hun hundreds? Yes. Of games for the dragon, hundreds and hundreds, yes. um, some of which have probably never been seen by Coco owners, and uh, and this is a the dragon's a close cousin to the Coco, and a lot of these games will probably play as is with little or no modification, especially if it's just using the joystick. Um, so I just thought this was kind of cool, and I want to thank uh, Davey Mitchell for sharing that with us. Davey also recently became a patron of the show too, so thanks for doing that, Davey. So um, there we go, little drag. Matter of fact, what do you know? I, what year that came out, Stevie? Uh, I'm reading. I'm. Let me pause the video now. I'm reading what Davey wrote here. Uh, you know what? Let me do this. Let me switch back. I think it was. Um, if uh, I think if I just rewind the video, I think at the very beginning, one of those screens maybe said what year it came out. Um, 1986. So, I mean, there's there's games similar to this in, in mar modern times, like Enigma is one I played on the Mac in the late 90s, and I think it's been ported to iOS and stuff too, where you basically angled these little drum things to bounce water droplets to try to collect them at the end, and it's kind of similar concept, but done years ahead of, of the modern game versions of it. So uh, this is quite an interesting one for me. I hadn't seen this one before either. Yeah. But it, it's a precursor to some modern games that uh, I didn't know were done this far back. Yes, 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 yes. So... Um... Very interesting. But yeah, yeah, in the UK, they do have uh, a limit on the number of colors that the uh, cocoa can produce because it does not produce. How would you butcher artifact? Dragon. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the dragon. Yeah, they've already they've already butchered the word color. Can they butcher the word artifacting too? Um, well, artifacting doesn't work. <laughs> artifacting doesn't work in, uh, in, in Britain either because yeah. it's... Uh, so uh, most of their games use the actual real color modes. Yeah, I think that was a Trump embargo on trade that prevented those <laughs> colors from making their way over there. Um, so, yeah, very cool stuff, though. Cool stuff. So, um, yeah, we do have a commercial for the Coco Do somewhere in our lineup. Um, <laughs> what I would like to do for today is, uh, I don't know what else you guys want to talk about, but I would like to start to wrap up today's show, save some for tonight. I don't know if you guys want to do an After Dark tonight. A normal after dark or a combined after dark with um, with more dungeons of Daggerath, which I would be in favor of. Um, but um, so since the, the the topic now is winding down, uh, what have we not talked about? What would anybody like to talk about as we start to end uh, phase one of our show <laughs> for today? We got at least nine shows to do today, so I've, I've got uh, one bit of news I wanted to carry over because it kind of happened uh, before last week's show, but we didn't have the details at the time. Does it involve Colors? No, this involves Glenside. Ah, okay. So they, they had their elections. Uh, the polls closed October 18th, and the, and the four people that were, we already announced that John Linville won as president. Um, I, we didn't mention the other ones. Vice president is Tony Pedraza. Okay. Treasurer is Brian Gores, and secretary is Richard Baer. Okay. So I just wanted to publicly announce that. So everybody there knows. we go. So John Linville is now officially president. Yeah. I got a plan. I got a really big plan. It's a good plan. I'm not going to reveal the plan, but I've got top people working on it. And so, making the cocoa great. <laughs> making the cocoa great again. <laughs> so, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, the boss. We can do a Boston art. Uh, uh, Jenna's here. Hey, Jenna. Jenna's recently popped into our community recently, too. You should join us on the call, or if not now, maybe later tonight. But yeah, we can do a Boston uh, accent and artifact. An artifact. <laughs> We're going to pack the car where it's been artifact in the yard. So, um, yeah. So yeah, we have. You, well, the thing is, a lot of people don't know. Jenna used to work for EA. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yep. wow. On some of the old stuff. So. Yeah, definitely be interesting to have her late at night and talk about the uh, the other systems that she worked on too. Yeah, cool stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I, I've uh, just quickly uh, found the uh, tile editor for Popstar, which does have tiles. So yeah, if you want, I can quickly pop that up. So maybe that'll make uh, the whole okay. It's, tile yeah, it's, thing. A bit, yes, it's just, it's easier to see things that are visually there. So by all means. Okay, so is oh look at those colors, yes. So this uh. is the uh, tile editor for <laughs> Popstar Pilot, and uh, like uh, the Gunstar one, see the flashing cursor, which um, I'll just get my cursor going. So that's the cursor in the actual sc Popstar Pilot, being a horizontal scrolling uh, game. Mm. That the the the, 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 scr the display goes. Um, horizontally and there's more screens after and before this so basically I, I choose a segment of the screen mm -hmm. and then I can I can go down to the bottom part which is the equivalent of the left hand part in Gunstar yeah. and I go through and I choose a tile see these are the tiles that I've drawn mm -hmm. so for example uh, I, I pick a tile I've got to remember what all the controls were um, and then move up. Ease of use. Okay. <laughs> I, I have for instructions. I just, uh, <laughs> Perfect timing. So, like, so I can, you know, build things together. I mean, this is just, just rubbish I'm putting together now. But, uh, yeah, I pick my tiles from down here, mm -hmm. and um, I can uh, build my terrain. And so what are, the, what are the tile size on this set here, like 16 by 16? I, I thought they were 16 by 16. So, so uh, yeah. So every square can contain one tile, which is 16 pixels square. Yeah. And then you, and so that 16 pixels divided by the 320 is, I, I can't do that math, but that's what, 20, 20 tiles across? Yeah. Well, well, you think about it. I mean, whatever size that screen is in the top part of the screen, mm. if it was just a, a bitmap screen, um, I have to calculate the right uh, mm. actual size, but say that's a 16K screen. Well, by using tiles, it won't take up that much. It it really just takes up the number of tiles. These, these right. Screens. It's 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 almost treating a, a a graphic screen like a text screen, where one yeah, one yeah, cell yeah, is, is that. Exactly. But you and but you're doing tiles, a smooth scroll on it, so it's not jerking it by well, sixteen pixels. Yeah, so. they, it, it is in the end. It is a bit map screen, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm using it as as if it's a, a text screen with a, a character right. set. But the characters are these graphics down the bottom. And I build my entire level, and, and that's actually all the tiles in um, in Popstar Pilot. It actually had a very small number of tiles, and yet it could do 80 screens. Yeah, um, how uh, how fast is your routine to render one tile on the screen? Because you're talking about 16 pixels across by 16 pixels down. Do you have an, an, something optimized that was able to 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 basically paste that tile onto the into I'm memory. I'm just using get and put. So I get No, I but get I'm talking and in, in in your assembly language in the game. When you uh, well when that, you're when you're generating the tiles in well, the actual it, game, how fast is that it, routine? It doesn't quite work by pasting an entire tile. Uh, it um, once it makes a map of what all the um, the levels will be during the game it reads that map but it reads in popstar pilot's case because it's uh, uh it, it reads all the tiles in vertical columns and it reads say the extreme it, it, it reads one strip only and draws it off screen scrolls the screen a bit then it'll go back and do another vertical column but it'll do the next strip Mm -hmm. It's a bit hard to explain. Uh, no, I understand that part, but I'm just thinking, yeah. like for, for the case of Rick Adams, this this is probably something that would help Temple of Rom, instead of him having to plot the lines and all that kind of stuff. If he could just paste tiles on the screen, I'm just wondering how fast your routine is that actually generates those. Well, it doesn't have to be too fast, but if, if every tile is 
16, let's say 16 um, um, lines um, high, and there are vertically, um, say, 10 tiles for every screen vertically, that means I'm only moving 10 by 16 bytes each frame, mm -hmm. which is very small. Remember, I don't have to, I'm not erasing the whole screen. Once it draws a strip, a vertical strip, the next vertical strip to appear on the screen, it then moves the entire screen left using the hardware scroll. So once it's drawn, that's it. I don't need to touch anything else. It moves it all to the left. Next frame, it will draw the next vertical st uh, strip just off screen. Mm -hmm. Once it's done that, it then scrolls it into screen um, using the horizontal scroll. Yes, yeah, so you're I'm only not, drawing one strip per screen yeah, refresh, basically, right. instead yeah. of the whole. So you're, you're not even updating the whole slow. screen. You're, yeah, you're up to it. Yeah, it would be too slow as Rick has found. Yeah. Now, Gunstar is a little bit different in that I have gone back to a, a method whereby I am actually redoing the whole screen, and if I was using the same resolution, say what 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 Rick's doing, then yes, that's a lot of RAM to do, and it just won't do it fast enough which is why you have to make other compromises. Uh, so I've gone to a lower resolution mode. Mm -hmm. So let a tab a bit less RAM to, uh, to yeah. move around. So, so are you using an ASR in <laughs> S2 and arithmetic shift, right? Mm. <laughs> in this one? No, uh, no, I'm not. It? Okay. No, it's, it's, it's entire bytes. Um, okay. Uh, because every byte in a 320 by 200 uh, screen is two pixels. Two so pixels per byte, yeah. The scroll is there for a two pixel. Um, uh, Which well, happens to work out to be very smooth. Well, yeah, it, it, it's actually not true. It's actually uh, the horizontal scrolls are actually two bytes at a time, which is four pixels. Ah. And then uh, something else to, to make it two pixels. Anyway, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. That. That's, that's, now, um, now, now you're getting into crazy talk. But this is the point. You have to sometimes take a sacrifice somewhere, uh -huh. uh, as I've done in resolution, in order to get the speed. The speed I've got, the, the, the reason I've done this in Gunstar, whereby I, I do copy or erase an entire screen, the benefits are not really obvious first up. You know, it's, it's a very, very expensive to be uh, doing that just to move a, a few pixels around on a screen. Uh, that and that's what Rick's seeing. He's he's got a few pixels, but he's doing a, a complete screen wipe, which is overkill for for the amount of graphics on the screen. Sure. But I've got plans to have more graphics. Hopefully, if this all works out, I am mm -hmm. going to have a lot of graphics in Gunstar, and that's why I thought, well, maybe maybe it'll work to my advantage if I can do the the, the screen clear or copy very quickly once. Yeah. Uh, and then later on, hopefully, I'll get a speed benefit whereby I can put all the sprites up very quickly. So we'll see. Watch this space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. That's anyway. awesome. Well, that, well, that's the thing is other game systems, you know, whether it be uh, uh, Nintendo's Super Nintendo or Sega mm -hmm. Genesis or whatever, they have these built-in tile graphics. Yes, that's yeah. right. And they scroll based on the hardware it's so you and then you put the sprites on that's the way they're designed to work and that's why you do games that way and et cetera, et cetera. we have a very very simple graphic system that has a lot of flexibility but at the same time it takes a lot of work it de yeah that's right there's benefits and uh, disadvantages in both systems mm -hmm. some games will benefit from uh, from a bitmap a totally bitmap screen other games, uh, the tile system is a, is a better system, especially when it comes to scrolling larger areas of RAM around. It's easier to to scroll around, you know, hardware tiles. Think of it as hardware tiles, I guess. Sure. Um, it's it's easier to to scroll those. It's less RAM for starters. We don't have that, so we have to do this more convoluted way of creating graphic tiles on a bitmap in a bitmap uh, format, and then <laughs> You know, pasting them up on the screen and whatever. So that's where the power of the 6809 and TFMs and what, stack blasting and whatever else have to come into play. But certainly looking at the game and maybe doing some sacrifices or compromises um, 
in Rick's game. He's doing an entire screen, clearing it all in order to put a couple of lines on the screen. Well, do you need the entire screen? Is the game actually moving the entire screen? If it's not, then maybe you only need to do a portion of the screen, the active area. Then, then the amount of RAM is reduced and maybe he'll get the speed up. Right, there you go. Yeah, it's too bad Rick's gone, uh, but he's yeah. Well, we can. That's yeah, that's the best time back. to talk about somebody when they're not around. So yep, um, that's right. <laughs> oh, there he is. No, hey, 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 Rick. Yeah. We were just talking about you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, I I totally agree. Yep. <laughs> well, anyway. that's a, that, that's the beauty of Discord is we can discuss this um, ad nauseum. Length and yet, well, I was going to say more at length, more technical, and more ad nausea. <laughs> and not bored too many people because only well let's see you you kind of get an idea about how many people drop off on the chat if you really put them to sleep yeah well we were we were up to like 30 and we're still at 27 so not too many have dropped off so that's oh. good yeah, just, just jim brain dropped off so we don't yeah <laughs> <laughs> um okay. all right so so by show of hands how many people want to do an after dark tonight around nine o'clock Sure. Ron Devo. All right. So I'll most of us it. are back on. Okay. So I we're going to do I another one. Might be a little late. Refrigerator. Yeah. What, uh, what other parting thoughts do we need to let people mention before we wrap this up today? Anyone? Let's don't forget Tandy Assembly. Tandy Assembly. Don't forget it. TandyAssembly.com. A couple weeks away. Uh, November 10th and 11th, Springfield, Ohio. And uh, be there or be square. Um, cool, cool, cool. All right, so we're gonna start. We're gonna start the closing credits for now. Oh, Paul for us, Paul Fiscarelli says raising hand. By all means, Paul. Paul. I've been for candy assembly or for tonight. No, that was that was in response for tonight. Oh, for oh, okay. for Dungeons of Dagarath tonight. Yeah, after dark. Okay, you want to update us on Long Branch Never, or just tell them to go to the channel and check it out? Any teasers? So so now I've been kind of busy with family stuff and uh, some side projects lately, so I haven't updated a video yet. But uh, one thing I did want to note when um, I brought up Steve uh, Steve's code and was taking a look at it, um, the second half of it looks like it's all commented, commented out. And that's because of the use of the asterisks as a, a multiplication operator. Um, I made a change to the UDL and I posted that back on GitHub uh, in a gist file. And uh, in the next episode, I'll go over how to uh, update your UDL in the uh, Notepad++. Yeah, I have to admit, I did have to modify your thing so that it looked correctly. Yeah, exactly. So it, yeah. it, it, the UDL stuff in Notepad++ is nice, but it's a bit limited. I mean, to make the distinction between a multiplication operator versus a comment is, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to do. So, but uh, it's, it's there and I'll go over that in the next, uh, next episode that I post. Okay, so is the is the most recent episode Hello World Part Two then? It is. Yep. Okay. Uh, the the one that I've been working on actually is um, it's um, getting Mame and XWAR installed and in, uh, running and showing a little bit of the debugger uh, in Mame. Um, so, ah, okay. Yeah. That'd so be... just just to get uh you know everyone uh, up and running with all three platforms and showing the differences between the three and how how all of them have uh, uh, their very strong uh, uh, suits and whatnot. So that are they're all great to use and all great to test across. So. Sure, sure. And the one comment that you should probably mention to the folks is make sure VPC or your um, main program is closed and not operating before you go through and do your batch file. Uh, yeah, and, and that's why that's why I didn't. Um, that's why when I call the uh, the executable to run, it leaves it, um, the command window hung there. And so yep. you actually close it. And the reason was because I didn't want people to just start launching a couple hundred uh, BCC windows without realizing they were running in the background. Well, the other thing, too, is for me, I was getting error 215. I couldn't figure out what program was causing and what was going on. Uh, and then I realized, oh, it's trying to write to a file that's in use. Yep, exactly. So no it's, it's, no, it's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the tip, Steve. Yeah, because once I close VCC, hey, the batch file worked. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and and Paul, I can't thank you enough for setting that up. Just if, yeah. even if even if I stop watching your videos, the fact that I ne which I won't, by the way, but if I did, <laughs> well, I appreciate uh, it. <laughs> you know, my my loyalty is very affordable. But yeah, um, <laughs> um, the the fact that you have given us this simple to use way of having an editor and an assembler and, and an emulation environment with you know. 
uh, fairly easy process now. It's something that I not, I don't think I would have arrived at that process anywhere near as easily or as efficiently as you did. So just pointing well, us in a direction and kind of guiding us through it has been, you know, immensely I, helpful. I, I now, you, you're doing one more thing that's really important. You're supporting it. You're doing updates as needed. You're explaining everything that's that's going there. If you follow the videos, you're not going to get in trouble. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So thank you for that, Paul. Uh, what is Jenna saying? I says I dug out a bunch of discs from my closet the other day. Found my Coco cassettes there too, and some of some are from the EA days. So I hope to find some good stuff on them. Just need to get a floppy drive. Ah, well, we might have some people that could help you out with that. Uh, David. Early, uh, earlier, <laughs> speaking of EA, somebody in the comments earlier said they really liked the uh, one on one, which was an EA game for the Coco. Right. So. Um, oh, Paul says just lost power to the house. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so we're going to wrap it up. Uh, final thoughts. Are we good? We're I good. Think so. yeah. All right, so we're gonna yeah, we're gonna start the closing credits. You have one more chance to think about something clever in just a minute here. So here we go. Cue outro. This concludes another episode of Coco Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. For all things Coco Talk, visit us on the web at cocotalk.live. We'd love to hear from you. Send feedback, suggestions, Dead even hair. segments via email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live. If you love the color computer like we do, then visit imacoconut.com for all your color computer links needs. Consider supporting the show with a purchase of merchandise from our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, visit the Patreon link on our site at cocotalk.live. Coco Talk would not exist without the community and its cast and crew. Thanks go to Curtis Boyle, David Ladd, David Mark Ladd. Overholzer, Grant Leedy, Bruce Moore, Nick Morentes, Ron Delvo, Rick Adams, Jason Riker, Richard Lorbieski, Jim Brain, Karen Anscombe, Simon Jonason, Wayne Campbell, Steve Batson, Brian Joyce, John Strong, and Barry Nelson. Special thanks to Steve Bjork for production suggestions and Brian Joyce for our best of episodes and bonus content. Please help support the Coco community by visiting some of its contributors. The Coco Crew podcast at cococrew.org. Glenside Color Computer Club, host of Coco Fest at glensideccc.com. Jim Brain and Retro Innovations at go, the number four, retro.com. Tandy Assembly at tandyassembly.com. Boyson Technologies at B-O-Y-S-O-N tech.com. Get your own switcheroo at cocoman.biz and Cloud9 Technologies at cloud, the number nine, tech.com. Coco Talk is hosted by Steve Strobridge, co-hosts, technical directors, segment hosts, and producers, Curtis Boyle, David Ladd, Grant Leedy, Mark Overholzer, Ron Delvo, and Jason Reichert. Production motivation, Steve Bjork. The Coco Talk theme song is copyright 2008 by D. Bruce Moore and Greg Shalar. Mix, mastered, and produced by D. Bruce Moore. Coco forever, people. And let's not forget a very special thank you to Roger Taylor for getting us on the Coco TV channel on Roku. David Ladd. Oh, I'm much happier breaking stuff. Thank you. Yes, you're too kind. And thank you. MC10. OG Stevie Stroh. All right. I just can't have, you know, can't press enough buttons, it seems like. All right. So... Nick Morota, did we did we acknowledge Nick Morota was on was in the live chat today? I don't recall. Yes, did we, we did. We did. All right. So we give we, a group shout out to him. A group shout out to Nick Morota. So we've had quite we've had quite the turnout in the live chat today. So Jenna is with us. Steve Bjork is here. Nick Morota. Nick Morota. Nick Morota. Mark Overholz are here. Davey Mitchell. Jay Brevin has been here. Paul Fiscarelli has been here. John Laurie has been with us from the beginning. Tom C. from Jersey. Rob Inman. Uh, Paco Otakte. And David Ladd. Wow, two of his personalities. William Carlin has been here. Um, just more people than we can even remember. Uh, Nick's neighbor, Chad, has been here. And Chad, by the way, Nick, Chad said you're a great ventriloquist because your lips never move when you talk. So, uh, <laughs> so that's your neighbor, Chad, with the real Australian accent, not that fake Kiwi talk uh -huh. that you have there. So, um, 
So who else was in the live chat today? Chad Cunningham, Mark Overholzer, Nick Morota. Nick Morota, Nick Morota. Steve Bjork was in the, uh, so many people here. Too many people to thank. I just want to say to all of you. Thank you. Yes, you're too kind. And thank you. And on the panel still with us, our resident Apple guy. We, we have symmetry in the universe. Uh, Mark D. Overholzer and his Apple II. Is that uh, Alien Downpour or is that uh, the uh, Asteroids one's going on back uh, there? It's uh, Onid Zone. It's, uh, oh, the o yeah, the okay, the, the, the Oid Zone, right? Oid Zone, yeah. Oid Zone, it's like a, Asteroids, yeah. It's, a, it's an Apple II port of a, a PC game from, I think, the 90s. Yeah, it's uh, neat. Yeah, the uh, guy who wrote it actually uh, was on the development team for the PC version, so. That's cool. That's cool. I've been watching that on the Apple. I, 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 I'm a lurker on the Apple groups. I have nothing to say because I don't have an Apple, and I just kind of like to look and see what people are doing, but that's cool. You don't have uh, an Apple yet. Yeah, not yet, yeah. But I love how that one, too, you can switch between the vector version or the raster version of the asteroid, all that kind of stuff. Cool features. L. Curtis Boyle has been with us from O Canada, where weed is legal, man. <laughs> it should get me in the programming zone easier, I yeah, think. Yeah, man. I'm going to come up with all these great ideas, man. I'm going to be looking into the electrons of the circuits and just be one with the flow and all that stuff. Gee, so. eh? <laughs> when you see fried egg <laughs> and bangers, you know I've been smoking up. So. Yes. Uh, you, need, you need to come on with smoke in your room. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> uh ron uh, ron del vo in the international space station and running yeah. manning mission control 19 wraparound screens Beep. here um you space force Beep. you keep you keeping the aliens out too and running space force force run yes uh, it's my division of battlestar galactica <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, we're going to do Dungeons tonight, Mr. Robot Shop. I mentioned your video earlier today. Uh, very special thank you for sunny Southern California, Mr. Steve Bjork, and showing us how to make a ball bounce today. Um, Mr. Thank you, you're too kind, Rick Adams. Thank you for being here. It was too kind of you. Uh, see, eh? Yeah, <laughs> eh? Where's Tim Hortons? Yes, yes. Uh, Greg. Friggin' Greg's been here. Grant Leedy. There you go. Hey, Grant, I think Richard Lorbieski had a message he wanted me to give you. Oh, really? What was it? <laughs> I'll tell you after dark. So. Uh, <laughs> and just uh, to remind you, I'll be on the road next week. I will be on location in Omaha, Nebraska with David Ladd. Dave, with, what, with who now? David Ladd. Yeah. Thanks for giving us warning. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of David Ladd, thank you for being here, David Ladd. Thank you, David Ladd. You contributed a lot today, I must say. Um, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm much happier breaking stuff. All right, and uh, <laughs> from down under, the man with the tile editor that contains no tiles whatsoever, Nick Marentes, has been here today. <laughs> uh, uh, Next up, a game with no graphics. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a game about nothing. What do you do? You stare at the screen. Uh, in a what's world his, what? where all the tiles are black and white. Yes, in a world where tiles have no now, color. Now, if you come up to Canada <laughs> playing that game, you'll see all kinds of stuff. So. <laughs> It'll be the most 3D immersive cocoa game you've ever yeah. seen. Yeah, you smoke the Canadian green, all of a sudden you'll see the Australian colors. So. Uh. <laughs> in both Alan and TSC simultaneously. There you go. Uh, and last but certainly not least, as seen at PenFest. 99 and 2000 at Corkscon, Hanvention, Coco Fest, maker of the Switcheroo, uh, Jason, the Coco Man Riker. Thank you for being here today. Oh, pleasure. And if you uh, if you experience Coco Talk for more than four hours, please consult your physician. Exactly. <laughs> Not gonna happen today. Not today, but maybe tonight. All right, phase two of the outro. Here we go. Hi, this is Antonio Jimenez author of such projects such as the Speedy Throw Devil and the SD Pack. And you are watching Coco Talk in three, two, go. <laughs> I'm buying you're making face. Okay. <laughs> you, you have a you're rolling, Curtis. You say whatever the hell you want to say. Well, give me some kind of guideline. Um, hi, this is Curtis Boyle. Hey, this is Eric, and you're listening to Coco Talk. All right, we're rolling. You say whatever you want to say, David. Right, I want to <laughs> 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 They should grow, sweetie.
Weekly, any computer. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. All right, I'm soon playing dagger is like that idiot from the book. <laughs> You're watching Coco Talk. <laughs> Thank you, David. I have. Now get back up there for one second. Oh, jeez. Come on. What? But, let's, but, let's get some dry wire, TTL, no, ESP. No, we don't need any dry wire or TTL. <laughs> Hi, it's Chris Boyle, part of the uh, Coco Jack crew of people. Hi, we're on Belbo Timberman. I guess I'll to uh, experience Coco Fest. You must come. I mean, I brought the only work in Pepsi 10. I could not get it. I could not get it. Could not get it. Couldn't get a grant. Ah. By certain someone you know. The world's leading weekly Coco Talk Show. Yeah, something like that. Hi, this is Rick Adams, and I'm the author of uh, yeah. Temple of Brahm, Shanghai, and now Bomb Threat, and you're listening to Stephen Stroke on Coco Talk. 8 slot MPI. You know, floppy drive, Coco SDC, um, sound speech pack, orchestra 90, RS-232 no. pack, modem pack, uh, super IDE. You start That's adding all two. those. Together, if you want them all used <laughs> at the, the world. same time, well, guess oh. what? You just went over the four-slot MPI. Oh, Lord. We've gone over the four-slot <laughs> MPI with... David Lang. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to put the audience and the show out of its misery. I'm pressing the hang-up button. No, you hang wait, up. Wait, no, you, wait, You hang up. What is it, David? <laughs> we got to have that 16 slaughter. Yes, we do. <laughs> you can bring along 15 friends. All right, so you hang up. No, you hang up. This is the sound of me hanging up in three, two, goodbye, That's everybody. That's enough. Just press the damn thing. Bye. Say goodbye, everybody. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs> Bye-bye. And Nick Marotta. God bless you, Nick Marotta. Nick Marotta. Glad you're